we would like to welcome you to this first regional meeting that the Sri Lanka Medical Association is holding uh, in collaboration with the Clinical Society of Chilau. Uh, and we are thankful for joining us uh, in this morning. And uh, without much ado, uh, I invite you to please uh, rise for the national anthem. Thank you. We welcome you again for the uh, first uh, clinical meeting, a regional meeting that is organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, in collaboration with the Clinical Society of Chilau uh, District General Hospital. A few uh, words uh, of welcome as well as housekeeping rules. We will be having this program as two sessions. The first session, will be aired from the Lionel Auditorium at the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And uh, the second session will be uh, solely done by the uh, Clinical Society of uh, Chilau Hospital at the auditorium in the hospital. So uh, there will be two sessions and two moderators, and we would uh, request you to kindly uh, send in your questions, pose in your questions through the chat box. Uh, that is in the Zoom link, as well as uh, you may, if you are in the auditorium, you may post your questions uh, uh, in audible form through the micro microphone. And uh, we will entertain questions at, at the end of all lectures in each segment. Uh, 
and there will be a, a break in between these, these two segments with T. Now I would like to welcome the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, to address the gathering. Good morning. Um, Dr. Sanat Fernando, the president of the Clinical Society Chilao, Dr. Kapila Malavarachi, Director, District General Hospital Chilao, Dr. Anushika Abhinayaka, Deputy Director, Clinical Society, uh, District Hospital Chilao, the council members of the Chilao Clinical Society and the Sri Lanka Medical Association. The, at the outset, let me thank the Dr. Sanath Fernando, the president of the Clinical Society Chilao, for the interest that was taken uh, in organizing this virtual regional clinical meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the clinical, Chilao Clinical Society. We consider this as a very great opportunity for us to associate our members, our colleagues from the other regions. In general, it has been a long held tradition for the Sri Lanka Medical Association to conduct regional meetings at least once in every two months in the past. These meetings were useful in two ways for us to mingle with our colleagues from the outstations, as well as to exchange the knowledge. While we may communicate important points from Colombo, there are many other things that need to be communicated from regions to the center in Colombo. So in that sense, and also it is not only for academic purposes, but also for us to, it was important for us to socialize each other and to get to know each other uh, as a single association. I mean, sort of the national organization of doctors uh, in Sri Lanka. But it is unfortunate that even in this year, uh, the COVID-19 situation has hampered our in-person participation uh, of uh, uh, this regional meeting in Chilao. So we have to meet virtually and uh, I'm very thankful for the interest again to Dr. Sanat Fernando uh, taken as well as the director and the deputy director for the opportunity provided. And from this side, I'm very thankful to Dr. Shehan uh, Silva for the interest and for lining up uh, a fantastic program that covers a wide range of topics that would be useful for uh, many ordinary doctors as well as for general practitioners. I think I need to make use of this opportunity for you to uh, mention few things of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, which has been, I mean, the oldest professional organization of doctors, which has been in existence more than 100 years. And, uh, 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 and if you are already not a member of this professional organization, I think that you need to uh, uh, hurry up and then to be the member of your own professional organization because it is the responsibility of all of us to keep our profession up to date. And the primary objective of the Sri Lanka Medical Association is the uh, building up of the professional skills of the doctors. So if I could mention few of the activities that have been lined up for this year, as usual, our leading activity for the year is the, uh, the anniversary uh, International Medical Congress that is scheduled to be held from 27th, 27th to 30th of July in this year. So I uh, request all of you to keep the date free and it would be available both for in-person as well as for virtual participation. So that uh, uh, that would be useful for anyone who would not have time to come here and to spend, uh, uh, I mean, uh, be wasting time on the road going up and down. And also there are many other activities that we do at present. 
and that is a webcasted uh, online so that it could be made use by any doctors in outstation. Say for an instance, we have the SLMA series of webinars in which we address the uh, current up-to-date uh, uh, topics. And also we have monthly clinical meetings that is focused more towards postgraduate education. And also we are planning to have from 20th of this month, the Saturday talk, uh, uh, SLMA Saturday talk that would be focused, that would focus mainly the uh, general practitioners, ordinary doctors, as well as the medical students. And also we have monthly uh, the voice of SLMA that we, where we address the media and public to uh, educate public. I mean, it's we, the SLMA feels that uh, it's our responsibility to educate public on topics that are of relevance to our health. So, I mean, uh, I just summarized a few of the activities, but then what is, uh, uh, what is being carried out by SLMA is vast. And uh, I would be happy that if the membership could subscribe to our Facebook page, YouTube, as well as to email, so that you could be kept informed of uh, activities that would take place uh, here from the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So with that uh, brief introduction of SLMA, let me very warmly welcome you to this uh, virtual regional clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, that is held in collaboration with the Chilao Clinical Society. And I uh, uh, take uh, this opportunity to thank our moderator and the senior council member, Dr. Sarat Gamini de Silva, for accepting our invitation to moderate this program. So uh, let me invite Dr. Sarat Gamini Silva to continue with the proceedings of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padmagun Ratna. Uh, good morning. Uh, let's start off by inviting Dr. Kesar Ratnatunga to address us online from Karapitiya. Uh, now he is the consultant surgeon at the emergency treatment unit at the Karapitiya Teaching Hospital. And he will speak to us on bleeding per rectum, a clinical approach. Dr. Kesar Ratnatunga. Right, okay. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you to the SLMA and to the Chilau Clinical Society for uh, inviting me to speak today. I'll just share my screen. Right. Um, okay. So, um, what uh, my topic today is being direct on a clinical approach. Um, so, my what I'll be talking about is um, how to approach a patient with bleeding per rectum uh, and what sort of mindset you should have uh, when you deal with such a patient who presents to you. I'll be talking a little bit about how a patient would present about delays, um, about problems with, with um, you know, uh, assessment uh, at the outset, and then the problems that could stem from that. Um, I will mention a little bit about uh, how to diagnose common problems, but I'm not um, hoping to go into detail about the management of the various etiologies, because um, what I would like to emphasize is a few key points uh, in the approach to these patients where you don't want to miss certain things. And there are certain sinister pathologies which are associated with bleeding per rectum, which can uh, go unnoticed if it's not properly assessed. Um, so to start off, um, bleeding per rectum is a very common presentation. We see it at almost all of our clinics. Now at surgical clinics, it's very common. But um, I'm sure, I mean, having spoken to a lot of my medical colleagues and uh, uh, GPs that I know, the bleeding per rectum is common in their clinics as well. So um, one of the things that we have noticed is that uh, patients who present with bleeding per rectum usually present late, um, various reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, there can be some element of embarrassment, uh, uh, some element of stigma and they don't come early. Uh, they sort of hang on to that because the bleeding per rectum usually is not painful. And there's just a little bit of blood in the stool. They notice it, uh, ignore it. And then, you know, it goes on for several months and then it becomes normal for them and they just forget about it. And then the presentation is usually when things uh, become a bit aggravated or the pattern changes or they have pain or something like that. 
and another uh, reason that they don't present early is that they fear the examination you know they are they are fearful of uh, you know exposure of invasive examination and also probably a a major thing that we need to think about is that they are not aware that uh bleeding per rectum can actually herald a more sinister pathology I and mean, people think that it's almost always due to hemorrhoids and that is a common perception uh among patients um but that you know uh, things like cancer inflammatory bowel disease can also be associated with uh, bleeding per rectum uh, is something uh, that you know patients should know but most of them don't um then from uh, from a medical point of view uh, there are is uh, uh doctors uh, who are uh, who see these patients uh, maybe in a gp practice maybe in clinics uh, maybe in medical clinics um sometimes due to uh, lack of time or lack of facility to properly examine uh, the assessment of a patient with uh, bleeding per rectum can be incomplete in the sense that uh, often we find that it is only a history that is taken and when the patient says there's bleeding per rectum the patient has not really been fully examined and as a result most initial problems have been missed so incomplete clinical assessment is a problem and uh, you know when they come by the time they come to surgical clinics uh, things can be slightly more advanced um often patients have had on symptomatic treatment only uh, there has been no further assessment as to you know whether these symptoms have changed whether there have been sinister red flag signs which have come up whether the bleeding has settled and certainly there has been no um, push for them to uh, undergo further assessment with endoscopy which we will talk about a little later and also patients have not been made aware that the bleeding you know although it could be hemorrhoids uh, that it it could herald something uh, more sinister like cancer so all of these problems put together uh, mean that patients who present with bleeding per rectum uh, can present a little late um which which can be problematic uh, in some instances so um some of the key messages that i want to highlight throughout this talk is that um with patients with bleeding per rectum although the predominant pathology is benign i mean is most often hemorrhoids but um uh, it's not always due to hemorrhoids that's something that you need to bear in mind it has to be within your system that you know hemorrhoids is though it's a common cause it's not the only cause and it is something uh, that we cannot afford to uh, assume uh, when when we deal with a patient with hemorrhoids so a sinister pathology must always always be suspected if you don't suspect it you will not look for it and therefore it's important to always bear it in mind and of these pathologies cancer is the one that we must always consider because that can be lethal uh, and if we keep uh, and if if some uh, cancer colorectal cancers are curable if they are managed early and if we want if we don't want to miss it and we don't want uh, the patient to present later on with complications or with advanced disease then um, you know at the outset in the assessment of patients with bleeding per rectum cancer must always be borne in mind so having said that what are the uh, common etiologies for um, bleeding per rectum i mean this is something that we all learn from medical school days uh this this i'm sure everybody knows um so hemorrhoids uh, fissures perianal sepsis are the most common uh, presentations of which hemorrhoids forms the bulk it's about 80 to 90% um fissures are also quite common um diverticular disease is not that common in this part of the world it's very common in the west but certainly in uh, in in um, in this part of the world it's becoming more common because of the change in dietary patterns uh polyps um inflammatory bowel disease they are again not that common uh, in comparison to the west but it's becoming more and more uh, prevalent in in sri lanka uh then patients who have had uh, radiation to the pelvis uh, or abdomen for whatever other reason uh, most likely malignancy the radiation induced proctitis is something we need to consider and of course cancer so this is one of the main etiologies that we as i mentioned earlier we cannot afford to miss um so uh, other less common uh, lesions are vascular vascular malformations um in the colon and also upper gi bleeding can also present with fresh bleeding per rectum it's very uncommon and the bleeding is i mean all of you are familiar with melina 
But if you have a high volume bleed, especially from the stomach or even from the small bowel, that can present as a, a, a fresh bleed into a rectum. Of course, these patients probably will not present to your clinic. Um, they will probably present to an emergency department um, or a casualty. So um, just to uh, summarize uh, a little bit or to recap on what are the specific points in the history that we need to, when we deal with a patient with uh, bleeding per rectum, um, I'll just break it up according to the pathology. Um, so hemorrhoids is the commonest thing. Um, painless fresh bleeding per rectum, that's, that's how it presents. Um, the, the blood is separate from the stool. That's something you need to ask, is the blood mixed with the stool or separate? And it's separate because the bleeding is terminal. The stool has formed by the time the bleeding has come on. And therefore, it is separate. And um, usually the patients will say, after passing stool, I have a drip, drip, drip of fresh blood. Some people say there is spurting and there is sort of, you know, a spray pattern on the, on the ceramic of the uh, uh, toilet bowl. So that is fairly classical of um, hemorrhoidal bleeding. Uh, similarly, in the examination uh, for hemorrhoids, I need to stress that um, you need to do, obviously, with a patient with bleeding per rectum, you need to do an examination and a visual rectal examination. But internal hemorrhoids are not visible on the outside. There sometimes are if the patient strains soon out to go into the toilet, but they usually uh, uh, go back in. And um, on inspection, you may not see anything. And then a digital rectal examination is usually painless. The patient will allow it freely. Um, and you will not be able to palpate internal hemorrhoids. Uh, they are not palpable. So that's something that you need to bear in mind. If you feel something there, then a simple uh, hemorrhoid will not be felt. It, it could be thrombosed or it could be some other lesion. So remember, it's very important to note that a digital rectal examination per se does not facilitate the diagnosis of hemorrhoids. You must proceed on to proctoscopy, which is the insertion of a proctoscope and, have, and having a look. Um, and it is only then that a sort of an uncomplicated um, you know, internal hemorrhoid can be seen. So it's a visual diagnosis. You cannot feel it unless the uh, hemorrhoid is thrombosed or the hemorrhoid is thrombosed and outside completely. Um, so that's a different story, but the commoner garden hemorrhoids need a proctoscopy for diagnosis. And that's something that we need to know. So in a patient with bleeding per rectum, a proctoscopy is, um, is essential, right? Um, fissures, uh, that's slightly different because the, it's, it's painful. The bleeding is fresh. It's the act of passage of stool is painful, very painful. Uh, because of the injury and the blood streaks the stool and that's fairly classical patients will describe it fairly well and the uh, stool is usually hard and the patient will like, give a history of having had constipation and passing hard stool for a while and their pain is there at the time of passing stool and also they have it for several hours after the passage of stool so that's something that um, we need to uh, uh, you know go into detail in the history on examination of patients with fissures, um, one of the classic features is a sentinel tag. So at the bottom of the fissure, you will see a tag. Um, you may see the uh, distal end of the fissure, but not always. And in these patients, the proceeding to a digital rectal examination or a proctoscopy is not that uh, not possible really because of the nature of pain. They will not allow you to do a digital rectal examination. So if they have pain, don't push it, don't uh, you know, uh, proceed because uh, it will be excruciatingly painful for the patient. And if you, uh, you know, you could cause injury, more injury by actually trying to um, go ahead with it. Then uh, perianal sepsis, by this I mean, uh, you know, perianal abscesses, perianal fistulae. So um, abscesses are very painful because of the tight, uh, the nature of the tissue planes and the tight anatomy in the anal region. It's quite painful. Um, and bleeding is not really a main feature of perianal sepsis. I mean, you can have a bit of spotting, a scanty amount of bleeding, but it's not the main symptom. Um, and fistulae, for example, they may they are not painful, but there is a certain element of a parvulent discharge, and sometimes you might see an external opening. Uh, in patients with abscesses, fever is a feature. And... Um, Rectal cancer, which is the main thing uh, that we need to exclude. Um, it's not common, but we need to exclude it. Painless fresh bleeding per rectum um, is, is what you find. A uh, sense of incomplete evacuation uh, is or tenesmus is something that the patients quite often describe. Um, and there can be mucus in the stool because of the tumor or 
Sometimes it is a tubular villus adenoma, which produces mucus. Um, and there's a fair amount of mucus in the stool. And uh, in these patients, you need to, well, all patients with uh, bleeding per rectum, uh, going into detail in a family history is quite important. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, not so common in this part of the world, but it's becoming increasingly diagnosed. Um, an alteration of bowel habits, mucus in the stool, abdominal pain, uh, sometimes associated with the passage of stool. And in the uh, instance of Crohn's disease, uh, you know, recurrent perianal fistulae or sepsis um, is one of the features that could uh, herald that there is an ongoing uh, Crohn's disease um, in the bowel. So these are all features that you need to look for in your history and in your examination. These are just guide, you know, uh, you know, these are the sort of the classical features which will point you in a certain direction. So putting all of this together, um, what are the red flags? You know, if the patient with bleeding per rectum comes in, when what are the things that need to sort of uh, make you start thinking that there is a problem uh, other than a, you know a simple hemorrhoid or a, a simple bleed? So um, blood mixed with stool, uh, that's one of the things because hemorrhoids, fissures, all of these things are terminal. The stool has formed by the time the bleeding has occurred. So the blood is on the outside and separate from the stool. But if the blood is mixed with the stool, that means that the bleeding is occurring at a point from which the stool is still being formed, which means it's more proximal. So that would herald a pathology within the more proximal part of the colon where the bleeding is occurring at the time the stool is forming. So that is very unlikely to be due to hemorrhoids or fissures or something common garden is something likely to be more sinister. Mucus with the stool uh, suggests that there is a, um, a secretory epithelium and also uh, a, an active epithelium. And also it's very common to have mucus in the stool in inflammatory bowel disease um, and also in things like tubular villus adenomas and even cancer. Uh, alteration of bowel habits occurs, uh, you know, uh, constipation, maybe diarrhea, maybe alteration of the so, alternation of the so, the, the, those uh, symptoms. Uh, and it can occur in uh, the diseases I mentioned. Abdominal pain, there again, you know, diverticular disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, all of that um, is associated with um, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, loss of weight. These things again herald, you know, a possibility of inflammatory bowel disease, um, cancer, uh, or something more sinister than just you know, hemorrhoidal bleed. And especially if the patient has a family history of colorectal cancer, then that immediately pushes you to think, okay, am I dealing with a cancer? Because um, the association with uh, colorectal cancer uh, in the family and its uh, genetic preponderance uh, and transmission is uh, fairly high. Um, okay, so uh, that this is uh, this is with regard to patients who present probably to your clinic or to an outpatient department or even to a GP practice, right? Um, but what about is there another group of patients who would present more acutely? Um, if the patient with bleeding per rectum is hemodynamically unstable, uh, for example, with tachycardia, blood pressure is slightly on the low side. Um, if there's obvious pallor, I mean, you look at the patient and he looks pale uh, with this, these uh, symptoms of bleeding. If the patient is faintish or dizzy, uh, if there's a passage of blood with clots, all of these herald that there is a certain, uh, you know, a high volume bleed. So um, if the you know, on digital rectal examination, if you do a PR and there is, uh, there are a lot of clots in the, in the rectum, the clot is full. In the proctoscopy, you try to do it and you can't see anything. The rectum is full of blood, especially, especially fresh blood. Or if there is active fresh bleeding without a visible source, then all of this suggests that there is a fairly high volume bleed. And these patients need admission because you can't send them home. You need to admit them and further investigate them until A, the bleeding is controlled and B, you find the etiology. Um, because sometimes these can be, you know, uh, colonic bleeds, which needs angiogram, embolization, and so on and so forth. So these are, uh, you know, things that these patients, the stabilization alone is not enough. Uh, you need to push forward to find the source of bleeding uh, because otherwise you can stabilize the patient, the bleeding might stop, the patient may become stable and you send the patient home and he can have a catastrophic bleed at home. Um, so a few words on uh, examination. I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the use of uh, proctoscopy. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, the digital, digital rectal examination is essential. 
you know, you need to spend time on it. It's not just a cursory, um, you know, examination with finger in. You need to inspect the perineum because you pick up fistulae, you pick up uh, sentinel tags, you pick up uh, perineal abscesses on the visual inspection. Um, prolapsed thrombose MRIs is something that you will be able to see. Um, digitation, there again, you know, if the patient is in pain, don't do it. But if, if at all possible, always do a rectal examination because certainly lower third uh, rectal cancers, you can feel as an ulcerated, uh, everted, uh, you know, irregular edged mass. Um, and you really don't want to miss that. Um, proctoscopy in these patients is essential for the reasons I mentioned earlier, because, uh, you know, a patient with a simple internal hemorrhoid, which is bleeding, you will not see anything on the outside. And a digital rectal examination, you won't feel it. So a proctoscopy is essential because that will show you the hemorrhoid and it will uh, allow you to um, make the correct diagnosis and also to, uh, you know, sort it out. You, I mean, if you are able to, you can put a band on it. Um, but more importantly, you have identified the source of bleeding. But remember, even in a patient with a low rectal cancer, the proctoscope will allow you to visualize the tumor. So um, it, it's important for the diagnosis. So doing a proctoscopy, if at all possible, is mandatory. And, you know, some people would argue there is no time in a busy clinic. But I think given the yield from doing a proctoscopy and, the, you know, the sensitivity with which we can come to a diagnosis or find other problems, um, doing a proctoscopy for patients with bleeding PR should be mandatory, not, not in a surgical specialty only, but in, in any practice. Um, so a few words on hemorrhoids, um, because I mentioned a lot of people are a bit unfamiliar, not too happy to do a proctoscopy. Um, I mean, we've all learned as medical students how to do it. It's not that difficult. Uh, it just takes a little more time. But uh, this is this image shows you a cross section of the anus and the lower rectum, and you can see uh, the internal hemorrhoids. Uh, what you see here is an external hemorrhoid, which is a different pathology. But what we're mainly talking about are these internal hemorrhoids, so which needs a proctoscopy to see. This image shows you prolapsed thrombose hemorrhoids. You know something that's outside; you can't miss it. The moment you look, you know what it is. But in these subtle um, internal hemorrhoids, you need to do a proctoscopy. And uh, if you look at this image, uh, this shows you what you will see, a bulging, darker colored uh, hemorrhoidal mass. And here you can see this is a view, both of all of these are views through the proctoscope. And this will make you identify the hemorrhoid. None of these would be palpable. So you need to do a proctoscopy to come to your diagnosis. Okay, um, so a slight shift. Um, so, if we see hemorrhoids, you know, in a patient who comes with bleeding per rectum, if we see hemorrhoids, should the assessment end there? If you do a proctoscopy, you see hemorrhoids, okay, it's bleeding from there. Should the assessment end there? Is it reasonable to say, okay, I know what the bleeding source is, I know um, why this patient has presented, and I am able to, you know, treat it if possible? Uh, should the assessment end there? Well, the answer is no, because. Um, uh, if you look at this, is just some data from the WHO from 2020, just a few numbers just to highlight the, the you know, the gravity of the problem. So um, worldwide, uh, we're talking about 10% of all cancers are actually colorectal cancers. So it's a very high percentage. And in Southern Europe, where the incidence is the highest, out of 100,000 population, up to 40 men will have colorectal cancer. That's very high. Right in South Central Asia, um, probably representative of our uh, our population as well. Out of 100,000 population, the men will have a uh, 6.6 .6 men will have um, colorectal cancer and 4.4 in women. So we don't have you no know, accurate data for Sri Lanka, but these are just ballpark figures from the world, which we may be able to extrapolate. But what I want to highlight is that colorectal cancer is quite common, um, probably the third most commonest cancer in the world. Um, and you know, next to breast cancer is 11% of all cancers and uh, colorectal cancer is 10%, so it's right up there. Um, so um, what that means is that the incidence of cancer is something that we need to bear in mind, we can't discard it. So if a patient presents with bleeding per rectum and you see a hemorrhoid, fine, it, it is most likely to be the cause of the bleeding, but if there is a concomitant lesion above it, uh, say, uh, a, a malignancy above it, we see the hemorrhoid, we assume that the hemorrhoid is a source of bleeding, we'll miss the cancer above. And hemorrhoids are so common that, you know, uh, uh, seven out of 10 people will have hemorrhoids. They may not bleed, but they may have hemorrhoids. And you assume that the bleeding is from the hemorrhoid, but actually it's bleeding from above. So, and the proctoscope, it may be just beyond the reach of the proctoscope, so you won't see it. And it's not palpable either. So, in, uh, in with that in mind, 
it is probably prudent for pa all patients who come with bleeding per rectum to have a further assessment of the colon to look for any more proximal pathology. So in that light, uh, if I just take you to this diagram of the colon, um, if you look at these numbers, uh, this shows you the percentage incidence of colorectal cancer in each of the sites of the uh, colon and rectum. And of that, if you can, if you just add up these numbers, you can see that in the left half, that is left from the anatomical point of view, the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum will have up to 65 to 70 percent of all the uh, colorectal cancers. So, with that in mind, what we recommend is that if a patient presented bleeding per rectum, okay, that may be there may be hemorrhoids, maybe bleeding, but they should undergo at least a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Because if we do a flexible sigmoidoscopy, then the, the you know, of the 75 you know, 70% of tumors which are on the left side, there's a reasonably good chance of us picking us a more proximal lesion. Okay. Um, so uh, a, if you look at this, a sigmoidoscope will allow you to go up to the splenic flexion. We usually go beyond splenic flexion to the mid transverse colon. Uh, a colonoscopy would be better in the sense that it goes all the way across to the cecum, but um, the two procedures are slightly different in that the preparation is different. The colonoscopy needs a full bowel preparation with, uh, you know, um, polyethylene glycol. It's a bit of an unpleasant process. The patient may need sedation to do uh, the procedure. Now we tend to do it without, but only if uh, the sedation is necessary, but we need to prepare the patient for it. So it's a bit of a more drawn out process and the complication risks are slightly higher. Whereas a sigmoidoscopy is very quick. It's an outpatient procedure. You come in, have an enema, you empty your, uh, empty your bowels in the endoscopy unit itself in the toilet and you have the procedure done, no sedation required and you go home immediately. So given the logistics of that, um, you know, uh, and the burden and the time taken and the risks involved uh, in a patient with bleeding per rectum to have a flexible sigmoidoscopy is not a big deal. But of course, you know, in the garment setup, there is a lot of uh, pressure with regard to time and backlog. But this is something that we really need to consider, certainly in the old age group. Um, and uh, in patients over 40, definitely. Um, but I'll move on to whether we should be considering this for the younger patients also. But certainly if the patient's having bleeding per rectum, if the patient has other sinister features like mucus in the stool, if the blood mixed with stool, if there's iron deficiency anemia on the blood reports, um, there's a family history of colon cancer, then a sigmoidoscopy probably will not be enough. You need to go for a, a, a full uh, colonoscopy uh, because of this higher, higher risks. Um, so this is what I mentioned earlier. So uh, an, another, another uh, point that I want to highlight is should younger patients also be having a sigmoidoscopy? Um, early on, it was not, you know, if you were a patient you know, 20, 25 came in, you bleed in per rectum, you saw hemorrhoids, then the chance it's unlikely that they would undergo further assessment. But now uh, this is data from uh, SEER data coming from the US and from the WHO. They have shown that um, if you look at the statistics, um, in patients age 55 and over, the incidence of colorectal cancer is declining year on year by about 2.4% since the 1980s. So the incidence is coming down. But more alarmingly, if you look at patients in the 20 to 39 age group, the incidence of colorectal cancer year on year is increasing by about between 1 and 2.4% per year. So the incidence of colorectal cancer in the younger population is becoming more. So whether we are picking it up early, whether we are tending to screen them more, or whether the you know factors such as diet, you know, eating processed meats, all that is contributing. This is not that it's not known, but certainly we need to be really worried about the fact that the younger age group is showing a rising incidence of colorectal cancer. So to put all of that into into context, uh, if you were born in the 90s, 1990s, and after you are twice as at, uh, at a twice as greater risk of developing colorectal cancer than those born in the 50s uh, because of this increase in incidence. So that's something to think about. So given this data, there are no guidelines as such, but um, if you have a patient, a younger patient coming with bleeding per rectum, then um, I would still think that, you know, going ahead for a flexible sigmoidoscopy is a good idea. Um, based on the data that's uh, that's coming, but there are no guidelines at the moment. Um, so a few take home messages. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, bleeding per rectum, it's a benign pathology is the most common thing. 
but it's not always due to hemorrhage don't don't make the mistake of assuming that the bleeding is due to hemorrhage even if you see it, you need to always always think that is there something more sinister going on because all of these pathologies are treatable uh, so if we can pick it up early uh, the you know the detection and the management is time sensitive so we need to pick it up early so don't uh assume that it is a hemorrhage or bleeding all the time you must go into detail into the risk factors and see okay does this patient need any further assessment and cancer has to be always always considered and consider sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy based on the the history and the examination findings um whether the patient needs further assessment and these these facilities are freely available now so um i think we should be uh, we should be utilizing it a little more so uh thank you very much um um i can, I, i would like to answer any questions that you might have if i am able good morning to you again the um uh, i'm actually thankful to shahan for uh, including my presentation as well because this is a, a very important area i mean acute stroke management the stroke itself is an important topic because uh, all of you uh in the audience as doctors may be aware that there are so much of advances that have happened in uh, uh i mean uh, in uh, stroke care that have improved the uh, recovery the uh, uh, survival uh, the disability and dependence of these stroke patients and been uh, taken uh, in consideration with the other specialties the development of stroke care uh could not be considered as satisfactory uh, when compared with the other specialties so therefore uh, i think it's an important topic wherever that we work uh, because these two admissions are not anything uncommon so now uh, uh, if we uh, consider stroke the uh, we know that we have two types of strokes ischemic and hemorrhagic so the at least i mean say when we talk 85% of discussion of our stroke is on ischemic stroke because that's the commoner form of uh, 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 commoner form of stroke as well as that many research and the developments had been on ischemic stroke so uh, the we would be discussing on hemorrhagic stroke as well but uh, 85% are ischemic stroke so why have we got to include and discuss of stroke because it's the second leading cause of death all over the world and here in sri lanka prevalence is 1 per 100 and if you take the national hospital there are more than 1000 stroke admissions to national uh, to teaching hospital kandy there are more than 1500 stroke admissions per year all leading hospitals get strokes admitted every year in thousands and the i mean it contributes the stroke uh, hospital deaths uh, say if you take in 2013 it was the third leading cause by 2014 it was fifth and then we came six and seven and in 2018 it's the fifth leading cause of hospital deaths but then you know that it's only about 30 to 40% of strokes that happen uh, do get admitted to hospitals in sri lanka so this actually is very much an underestimate of what is happening i mean what exactly the ground reality is so the you need to have a little bit of basic knowledge that when we are discussing on up to date acute stroke management i mean the, there are so much of advances i know that many of uh, you may in chilau as well as even at national hospital all these things does not happen but that does not mean that we should not be aware because we need to be aware what up to date management is if we are to expect some sort of improvement in stroke care over the next decade so we have the in uh, case of stroke if you have developed a stroke then all the time there is a reason the reason is either in the blood vessel or the constituents of the blood or from heart so the it could be from large blood vessels so large artery atherosclerosis it could be from heart cardioembolism or tiny little capillaries when they are affected you call it small vessel occlusions and then the there are rare causes like sla and antiphospholipid syndrome which are uh, described as others determine etiology 
etiologies and having done all investigations, if you still could not find the reason, then you end up with the undetermined etiology. So in case of large vessel disease, the problem would be either in the basilar artery or basilar artery or in the common carotid or in the middle cerebral in one segment or the M2 segment. So in majority, it is in the middle cerebral artery, either in the M1 segment or M2 segment, and the another smaller percentage is in the basilar territory. So the basic principle of acute stroke is that the, uh, 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 the development of the ischemia and the infarction, you know the difference between the infarction and ischemia. So if you consider the pathophysiology in the center of a, a, a stroke in ischemic stroke, you have this infarcted area which cannot be salvaged. But then around that, we have ischemic area, which is described as penumbra, which is threatened. And the, uh, the I mean, sort of, it is critically threatened. If nothing is done, about 75% of penumbra would join with the core over the next, I mean, from onset to the over the next six, seven hours, whereas about 25% would join with the normal tissue because of the opening up of collaterals. But if you could immediately recanalize this uh, uh, injury, uh, then you would save about 75% of uh, penumbra and it's only about 25% would join with the core. So with that, if you have salvaged the ischemic cerebral tissue, then you would see that there is better recovery because every cerebral cell is important for a function. So it is based on that principle that many of the therapeutic interventions have been defined uh, in management of acute stroke. So when I'm glad that if the directors are there in the audience, because it is not any uh, management that could be done uh, solely by a physician or a neurologist, but it has to be done. There are many components in the management because every hospital has to be ready to manage stroke patient. So there has to be a pre-notification system. And here in Colombo, the uh, Suasaria ambulance uh, 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 employees are trained to bring all ischemic strokes to hospitals where CT facilities are available. So that is how it has to be. And been, uh, because that it is available right now, they should be trained, requested to immediately bring all C patients. I mean, they, they need to be trained to diagnose stroke. And once diagnosed stroke, all hospitals stroke patients should immediately be brought to hospitals with facilities with CT scans. And then there has to be a pre-notification, hospitals should be informed in advance, and then there has to be guidelines in place for in, uh, in all uh, hospitals if you want to provide a reasonable, decent acute stroke care from the hospital. And the pathways have to be established and there is a need to train medical professionals. And there has to be a single call system to uh, uh, alert all important medical professionals who are important in the management of stroke care, yeah, such as the MOOPD and the uh, MO medical ward or the neurology ward and the radiology team, as well as the emergency doctors if they are available. And it has, they have to be given highest priority for CT and CT has to be done at least within 25 minutes of arrival to hospital. And then the recanalization procedures has to be in place at least within 45 minutes from the time, I mean, for door to needle time. And we need only very few lab tests as emergency procedures. I mean, it may be a random blood sugar that could be done even in the ETU. And in patients who have been on warfarin, there is a need for coagulopathy screen such as INR. And one need to immediately commence IV thrombolysis. So the, now, before that, the clinical diagnosis is important. So one need to establish the time of onset of uh, symptoms. So what we one would ask is the time that was that the patient was last seen normal. So you need to time it, use the clock time, and there has to be a focused examination. And one need to consider stroke mimics, but there shouldn't be any delay in commencing RTPA or thrombolytic agents, if you have 
uh, doubt because uh, they are, I mean, it is not a place that one could delay arriving at the diagnosis and delaying thrombolysis. And the, it's the, uh, very important that the protocols are in place and patients are taken through these protocols and the inquire questions with regard to anticoagulants, recent arterial punctures, medical conditions, and recent surgery and so on that would be included in the protocol. And the conditions mimic, mimics that you need to keep in mind are hypoglycemia, seizures, metabolic, and migraine with aura. So in the emergency ABC, we all are familiar, and then we need to document Glasgow Coma Scale, need to check whether the patient could understand and speak, and the eyes with the in which direction and power of limbs and the blood pressure management. And in NIHS scale is what we use to document the disability. It's important that that is available in OPD and trained doctors in medical wards and in OPD. So in NIHS, based on that, it gives the score up to 42. And if the score is up to about six, then you know that it's a milder stroke. And from six to 21, it's moderate. And the strokes that are beyond 21 are the worst form of strokes or severe strokes. And then one has to have the skill of clinically classifying the disease and be able to predict what the vessel that is affected based on clinical features. And it could be the patient is with anterior circulation involvement, or it could be that the patient is with posterior circulation involvement, or it may be that the patient is with lacuna syndrome, in which case the prognosis would be much better. Whereas if it's anterior circulation, then there are other options that are available, particularly in a hospital like National Hospital, the thrombectomy facilities are available. So immediately following CT, if the facilities are available, it has to be continued with the rest of the radiological studies. I mean, in best of centers, this, the technology has helped so much, I mean, to, for the advanced evaluation to differentiate the infarct from the ischemic region, penumbra. So based on the um, mismatch, one in, could intervene I mean, using a tissue uh, clock uh, and to define that there is ischemic tissue still available. So what are the types of treatment that are available? The, I mean, re for recanalization immediately is the chemical thrombolysis with the recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. And then the mechanism, there is data and so much of recovery for large vessel disease uh, the mechanical thrombectomy with the retrievable stent. And then the, I mean, those two are the sort of very specific types of treatment that are available that has made so much of a recovery uh, and a prognosis. I have contributed for prognosis of stroke patients. But in addition to that, there is so much that we could do in the acute management for to adequately the, make the patient hemodynamically stable and to manage the collateral flow. There is position, there isn't much of data with regard to position. I mean, say the, based on the risk of aspiration, you could manage them in the left lateral position. And the both hyper and hypoglycemia is disastrous. The ideal control of blood sugar has not been shown to contribute for better recovery. So therefore, the blood sugar has to be managed at least about less than 180 milligrams. The temperature and to prevent infection is important in the acute stage. And the BP management is very much individualized. Say for hemorrhages, we would prefer to reduce blood pressure up to about 160 milligrams, whereas for if it is for infarctions, based on whether we are going to thrombolyze the patient or not, the blood pressure management is going to be determined. So if the patient's blood pressure is more than 185 or 105, the blood pressure has to be reduced below that level before the patient is thrombolyzed. And if it's once the patient is thrombolyzed, it is likely that the patient may develop the infarctions, hyperperfusion infarctions immediately after. So one may 
reduce blood pressure. I mean, say if it's a large vessel occlusion, one may keep the blood pressure a little raised because that you want to may continue maintain the perfusion via collateral, but then immediately after thrombectomy, one may reduce the blood pressure a little to avoid hyperperfusion injury. Then the management of cerebral edema is important and early recognition and treatment of systemic complications such as dysphagia assessment, infection, heart failure, arrhythmia, and that type of things become important. So the acute reperfusion treatment is thrombolysis with recombinant tissue plasminogen activator given within 4.5 hours of symptom onset. And mechanical thrombectomy is useful when it is done within six hours. It's recommended for intracranial, uh, the uh, tip of the, intra the ICA, as well as M1 segment occlusions, middle cerebral artery occlusions within six hours, there is uh, so much of benefit if one could immediately arrange mechanical thrombectomy. And for those patients that on whom the onset is not known, then you could make use of the technology to find out whether there is viable ischemia. And the, I mean, uh, that is uh, what is described as MRI guided IV thrombolysis for stroke with unknown time of onset. So if the time, if, if patient has woke up with a stroke, you do not know the time of onset, but then from that point up to 4.5 hours, if you have done a MRI and if there is mismatch, DW flare mismatch, then you could imagine that patient is with a good amount of viable penumbra and then you could thrombolize that patient within that 4.5 hours. So for wake up stroke, there is a technology that you could make use of technology to elicit that there is viable tissue and continue with thrombolysis. And then beyond that, up to 24 hours, one may use thrombectomy again by using tissue clock, uh, the technology and having shown that there is viable uh, ischemic tissue that's available. So the many studies, all meta study analysis of randomized uh, control studies have shown that IV thrombolysis saves many lives. And there are 17 centers that are available in the in Sri Lanka itself that carry out thrombolysis. So one all the time need to be familiar. If there's a CT scan available in any of the hospital, there has to be a thrombolytic program and OPD doctors have to be trained, physicians have to be trained and that there has to be a thrombolytic program in existence if there is a CT facility available in hospital. So one need to be familiar. And if you have a CT and if you do not thrombolize, one should be able to question that hospital. Why do not they thrombolize patients? So as we know, CT hemorrhage infarctions take time to appear. In majority, when you do a CT is normal. And if CT is normal, then you know that it's likely that the patient has infarctions. But then there, there are ways that one could evaluate the patient using the, I mean, the infarction would gradually evolve, develop. So one has to train eye to see that. I mean, here it's the lent form nucleus and here you see that it's a blood. So over the hours, you see that the CT changes are appearing. So if you have seen these changes on the CT, initially what we used was one third rule. If more than one third of the cortex is affected, then you know that it's a worse impact. And the inpatients with uh, uh, CT, if the CTR changes, the CT is with changes. Now we know that it is a delayed stroke. And it, I mean, it indicates that there is infarcted tissue and the prognosis is may not be that all right, like when compared with the normal CT scan. So now we use this, use this aspect score to assess the extent of injury in the CT scan and based on the areas that are affected, you 
start with the aspect score of 10 and if if one area is affected you reduce one number so likewise based on aspect score you could grade the extent of injury one has to train eyes to learn the uh, recognize early infarctions and in all these you see infarctions which are sort of fairly extensive and in all these patients that the, they may be in a delayed state for thrombolysis and if you see this sign, this is a clot in the middle cerebral artery, dense MCA sign. And if see, it is normal, and if you have seen this sign, then immediately that patient has to go undergo an uh, angiogram and have to undergo procedure to remove that thrombus because if otherwise, you know that over the next few hours, the patient is going to be uh, uh, profoundly ill because of the middle cerebral artery occlusion. And I'm sure that all of us are familiar with this. This is how a ICH would appear. So all have to be able to recognize this. So once you have acquired these basic skills, then it is not that difficult for you to manage a person, stroke patient in an emergency unit with thrombolysis. And the CT is with many other facilities nowadays. You could do CT angiograms, you could do CT perfusion scans. So CT helps you to trace the vascular tree as well as to differentiate infarcted tissue from the ischemic tissue. So, uh, so then it reliably diagnose intracerebral uh, hemorrhages as well. So immediately when you do a CT in a center with the facilities, I mean, center of excellence, they would immediately continue with the rest of the study, but then there should not be any delay in commencing thrombolytics because that you continue with see a uh, uh, rest of the CT scan. So when you do a, a advanced CT scan, if you see a complete occlusion, then you know that there is, uh, uh, it is unlike, the thrombolytics are unlikely to recanalize this type of a complete occlusion. So this patient immediately in that center itself would undergo thrombectomy because the expectation one could have to recanalize this type of occlusion with thrombolytics is very minimal. Whereas if you see uh, the streaks of thromba, uh, contrast in that thrombus, then you know that th there, could be, there is some leakage so that one could expect the, uh, some effect with thrombolytics and one could uh, uh, continue to thrombolyze as well as if necessary to do thrombectomy. So there are many other advanced uh, technology. I mean, multi-phase CT scans add so much of information with regard to availability of collaterals, availability of uh, 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 the ischemia or infarcted tissue, and they all have added up for knowledge as well as for advancement of management of the uh, 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 cerebral ischemia purely based on CT scan. So CT perfusion also is another important technology. MRIs again would give you a lot of lot more information, particularly for wake up strokes. I mean, this is how an acute infarction would appear on a CT scan in MRI. In MRIs, we do this diffusion weighted images, and then it would show that an infarcted tissue in this way. And then in MRIs also, we could do the trace the vascular tree. And when we do flare scan, and by looking at the MRI, here is a CT infarction. This is our flare, a lacuna infarction. This is our DW. So this would appear immediately after the infarcted tissue happens. This would take about three to eight hours for appearance. So if there is a mismatch, if there is a DW image positive and flare is still has not appeared, then you know that it is still in the acute stage and there may be uh, ischemic tissue available. So in that type of facility, so if this facility is available, if you have done that, it then one could plan to thrombolize even wake up strokes as I mentioned. So if you see this type of MRI, where you see that bilateral acute infarctions. So if when it is bilateral, then it has to be either vasculitis or there has to be common source of thromboembolism like cardioembolism. 
So the one has to have the protocols in place for thrombolysis. There are inclusion criteria as well as exclusion criteria. One need not memorize all these things. If the protocols are done and are kept in place, then as the patient come, the doctor could take the patient through this checklist and could select the patients who would uh, be eligible for thrombolysis and who would not be eligible and to exclude them. So there are many indications as well as relative contraindications and the exclusions as well. The, and uh, then once you have selected the eligible person, you thrombolize with 0.9 RTPA, 0.9 milligram per kg, 10% is given as a bolus and the rest as an infusion. And the patient is managed in the intensive care unit over next 24 hours. Tenecteplase, which is being used by cardiologists, is another that is, I mean, that has proven or uh, promise, I mean, that has shown uh, results, uh, promising results with sort of very much equal outcome to recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. It is much cheaper and it's likely that tenecteplase would replace RTPA in near future. There are complications of IV thrombolysis in about 6.4% of the patients. They may develop intracerebral hemorrhages, but then the, uh, the uh, recovery that one could uh, 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 expect out of RTPA is way out of base very much uh, than the risks that are caused by ICH. Therefore, all the time, it's important that we thrombolize patients as much as possible uh, and to uh, uh, monitor them for complications. The uh, RTPA is known to cause angioedema, particularly in patients who are with on AC inhibitors. So one has to be aware of that and if necessary, be able to manage angioedema. The mechanical thrombectomy for large vessel occlusions has been shown to be of use. Uh, and I, as I told you, it's the internal carotid and M1 segment. And if it is done within nine minutes, the number needed to treat for, uh, uh, needed to treat to get uh, one patient achieve functional independence, one more patient achieve functional independence is 3.6, whereas if you treat within 91 to 180 minutes, it's 4.3, and between 180 to 270, for every six patients that you treat, there would be one more patient to achieve functional independence. So it's important that we establish, we try to establish all these forms of treatment, at least in main hospitals here in Sri Lanka. The, uh, the mechanical thrombectomy appears to be quite safe and this with minimum uh, complications, there is ICH risk 4.4%, but with experienced hands, with experienced hands, these risks are very much uh, minimal. Uh, I have already spoken to you how we manage with regard to wake up strokes and the how the DW and the FLAIR has helped us uh, to give I mean, scientific information on the management of wake up stroke. So this is how the, uh, I mean, basically acute treatment with endovascular therapy is uh, being practiced. Say once the patient develops a stroke, say if you do thrombolize within, if we, they come within 4.5 hours, there is place for thrombolysis, but then to get best out of the treatment, you have to thrombolize as early as possible. And then up to six hours, the, you have the, if it is for large vessel disease, then one may continue. I mean, sort of bridging with uh, RTPA and continue with thrombectomy. But then afterwards, say for wake up strokes, there is place for you to do MRIs and the DW flare mismatch, if there's DW flare mismatch, to continue with thrombolysis for another 4.5 hours. And say by using a tissue block, you could remove thrombus up to 24 hours for large vessel disease. Uh, I think that uh, uh, gives you a good account on the uh, uh, 
management of acute stroke and with regard to hemorrhagic stroke, the, uh, there are types, many types, basically uh, basic management uh, 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 for nursing and for ischemic stroke is very much the same, and, but there are markers of poor prognosis. The volume of ICH, if it's more than 60, then that is a poor prognostic indicator. And there are many CT signs, what is described as blend sign. If you see hyper and hypo densities together, black hole sign, if you see one black hole in the center, or if there are many islands, then they all have been shown to be the poor prognostic in, uh, uh, indicators of the intracerebral hemorrhages. And one has to train eye to recognize the intracerebral hemorrhage in the MRI. This is another important CT that one has to develop the skill to recognize. This is how a SH would appear on a CT scan. And that is very important to recognize because in case of SH, even if you have a suspicion on SH, then uh, uh, one may not use any of the thrombolytics. So the ICH management is reduce the bleeding. Uh, if there's bleeding disorder, you need to correct it. And blood pressure management, I have already mentioned, many would manage with conservatively, whereas only a smaller proportion who would be, uh, I mean, who would have the uh, hemorrhage, GCS uh, uh, hemorrhage more than uh, 40 millimeters and who are not comatose, flaccid on the serious state in between patients, I mean, who are with uh, uh, worsening uh, symptoms may benefit from surgery. I think I uh, tried to give you a sort of a, a summary of what generally need to happen to uplift the stroke care uh, in any of the hospitals and hope that this account was useful for you. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer any of the questions. Thank you, Dr. Gunratna. Next. Uh invite Dr. Shehan Silva to talk to us on multi-morbidity in old age. He is a senior lecturer in medicine at the University of Sri Jadhanapura. He is the assistant secretary of the SLMA as well as the secretary of the Sri Lanka Association of Geriatric Medicine. Dr. Shehan Silva, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a privilege for me to present uh, before you. Uh, my talk is on multimorbidity in older adults. In fact, this presentation should not be confined to the uh, age group of older adults, but in general, as prescribers, as clinicians, this, these concepts should be advocated uh, uh, in our management uh, of our, all our patients. So I pose in front of you this clinical scenario. We have a patient, Mr. A. An 87-year-old man who presents uh, with his son, who is the carer at home, he comes with extra extreme fatigue, and there are too many medications. If you look at uh, his list of medications on your right side, there are 14 medications. He generates a pension. He doesn't have an insurance. He is known to have congestive heart failure, diabetes mellitus, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, benign posture, uh, sorry, benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, Alzheimer's disease, insomnia. And you see that he's on two oral hypoglycemics, he's on three uh, anti-hypertensive drugs, uh, and he's on uh, tamsulosin, etc. And a, a whole heap of uh, nutraceuticals and supplements. You see that his minimental uh, score uh, is low, 23 out of 30, which has deteriorated uh, from a period of six months. He has a postural hypertension, as you can see. He has aortic stenosis. With his son, who he has, uh, he has a tug test of 20 seconds. Tug test is a test called time up and go test, where you uh, get a patient, especially older adult, to walk a distance of 10 meters after from a sitting position to stand up and walk and come back and sit down. If somebody takes more than 10 seconds to uh, walk a period of 10 feet, uh, that is uh, a, an indicator of frailty. 
you see that his HbA1c is not too bad, 6.8%. Uh, he has triglyceride of 300, rest of his lipids are fine. He has a creatinine of 1.7. So we see that with all these uh, conditions, he has multimorbidity. We come back to his, this case again. So multimorbidity is the coexistence of two or more long-term conditions. And mind you, when somebody has more than four long-term conditions, four or more, that is a complex morbid multimorbidity as, as our gentleman. And this overlaps with the entity called frailty, which is a talk of its own. So how does multimorbidity differ from comorbidity? So we have been used to uh, use this word called comorbidity, which we interchangeably use with multimorbidities. So comorbidity is existence of medical conditions along with other uh, conditions. So you have one particular disease like diabetes and you may have something, uh, let's say, uh, hypertension, and you may not consider that both of these conditions are interrelated. So if you take it into that, uh, out, uh, in out, that outlook, it is a comorbidity. But in multimorbidity, as I would explain in, uh, in the next slides, it's a you know, holistic view of everything of the patient. So has, this has implications of its outcome. So you see that if somebody has an inoperable bladder malignancy along with atrial fibrillation, if the surgeon thinks that these two are two different things, it, he may be thinking in terms of comorbidity. But if the patient is on warfarin or a uh, new oral anticoagulant, for atrial fibrillation, then there is a concern raised regarding multimorbidity. So the focus of medicine has changed over the years into this biopsychosocial approach, which we look at the patient, not only physically. We don't look at the patient psychologically. We don't look at the patient sociologically, but we have to see the patient in all three realms. So as I uh, discussed at the beginning, so we shift our perspective from comorbidities, where you have the index disease and around it, the comorbid diseases into this multimorbidity where there is overlap of conditions and this happens in the life of the patient. So multimorbidity includes two or more of any kind of problem. May they be physical or mental, diabetes, schizophrenia, depression. It may be an ongoing condition a, a diagnosis which is not there pres at present, but it's a problem, a learning disability in a child. It may be a symptom complex. For instance, frailty is not a, a disease of its own, but it's a, it's a complex, it's a syndrome. Same, likewise, it's chronic pain. And also other sociological fact problems like so alcohol, substance misuse, financial problems. So you see that as one age, uh, that uh, the chronic conditions increasing number is estimated that 50% of individuals who are falling between 65 and 69, 65 is taken as a cutoff for the geriatric population, more or less now the, the age, is, this is of uh, much debate, uh, but as of WHO uh, figures, 65 is taken. Uh, where if you, somebody is in this age group, two or more chronic conditions, uh, you have at least one out of two. And if somebody is at 85 years or more, you see uh, three fourth of uh, patients have multimorbidities. So it has clinical implications of its own. So you see that there, there, there may be with one single disease, there may be involvement of multiple systems. Best example is diabetes. You get involved with the kidney, the nerves, the eyes, and also the vessels. Also, uh, certain conditions can lead to another condition, a disease of its own, a different disease. Diabetes is associated with infections like skin sepsis, cellulitis, urine infections, and also other non-communicable diseases like ischemic heart disease and stroke, etc. You see that a single factor can predispose to multiple diseases. So smoking is the best example where one would get COPD, lung disease, lung malignancy, ischemic heart disease or gangrene. Or one problem may contribute to several other problems. Let's say 
if somebody has a fall, that may be related to a neurological problem. Maybe the patient is having Parkinson's disease. Maybe the patient is having dementia, Parkinson's associated dementia. Maybe the patient is having poor vision. Maybe the patient is having osteoarthritis. So you see all of these are, uh, acting in unison, causing a fall. And you see multiple disease begets multiple drugs and multiple drug interactions as we will talk about. Furthermore, you see that two different entities may cause a lot of confusion uh, in interpreting results. A patient may have iron deficiency, but along with that, the patient may have a vitamin B12 deficiency, both maybe because of nutritional problems. But these two can cancel out each other and give rise to a normocytic, normochromic pack picture if you look at the full blood count. Risk benefits of treating one disease may affect the presence, uh, uh, maybe, maybe affecting the uh, prognosis of another. So as an example, somebody has atrial fibrillation, needing anticoagulation as the Chad Vasco, but he may be having increased bleeding risk as per the Hasbled score due to chronic liver disease. So you need to uh, look at the risk benefits of each condition. Pharmacological treatment also can give rise to various abnormal physiology and pathologies. So this, you see that multimorbidity increases as one age. I won't dwell in a lot of time on that. And you see that multimorbidity also increases with poor socioeconomic status. So therefore, it is a huge burden in the developing world as of us. And also multimorbidity will uh, also give rise to increased complexity of care. Certain decisions that needs to be taken. Individuals who would uh, come into the picture, players, there may be subspecialists, therapists coming into this picture. So we'll talk about that again. So the consequences of multimorbidity includes there's an increased risk of functional decline and debility. The normal trajectory of a person going into frailty or deterioration can be accelerated by the fact of having two or more diseases. Maybe the disease itself, maybe iatrogenesis because of the medication that we have we impart on the patient, etc. This is frailty itself. And also because of the adverse effects of treatment as well as interventions, duplication of treatment and interaction, these things could give rise to poorer quality of life. And thereafter, a greater burden on healthcare, both for the healthcare professional as well as the, the uh, so health economics part of it. And it will entail emergency department visits in excess and uh, there will be a lot of inpatient admissions and more or less there will be increased mortality. There are some challenges to clinicians because this is because there is lack of evidence of a specific treatment in multimorbid patients. You see that there are so many guidelines. We have guidelines for MIs, we have guidelines for heart failure, we have guidelines for stroke, we have guidelines for bleeding. But when it comes to a patient with all of these together, do we have a single guideline? No, we don't. So we have to play by ourselves. So guidelines are guidelines. We have to, uh, uh, we come across a dilemma of taking the risk benefits and taking into account the patient as the sole uh, important person in the management. Multimorbid individuals also have other special management ch uh, challenges. For instance, as, as I mentioned, the regimen itself will become complicated. There will be complicated communication and co coordination needing between interdisciplinary individuals, therapists, the family, and also the patient. And whether the goals that we would get from disease A would impart upon a burden on disease B. Again, these are problems. So as individuals who are engaged in clinical practice, we have to identify proactively. Look for the adult or even a child who may benefit from a multimorbid approach. We have to be, we have to have a medical gaze, an opportunistic look upon the, the, our routine care in the ward round or even in the clinic. 
proactively look at health records if you do have that facility. Some certain hospitals do have that, but you may, you may, you, you should engage in this. Assess frailty and polypharmacy. So the American Geriatric Society has put out some guidelines, again, guidelines on intervening on multimorbidity. Look upon the patient's preferences, interpret the evidence, you check on the prognosis, look upon the treatment complexity and feasibility and optimize the therapy. We'll talk about this in our patient. So patient's goals and priorities need to be elicited. Speak to the patient, the family, and understand their perception, their social cultural uh, aspirations, maintain independence of the patient. Look what kind of a societal role that the patient may be having uh, with regards to looking after their, uh, from their children's children, even up to even having a, a post retirement job and the work uh, and their placement within the house, their home environment. Engage upon the preventative services and lifestyle changes that you can do. Advocate exercise, good diet, dietary changes, um, change of uh, adverse behavior such as smoking, etc. Decisions on drugs, hospitalization procedures. You have to have a clear discussion about what you are going to do in the future. So ask the patient: Are we going to? If you need, if somebody is develop, going in the direction of uh, end stage renal failure. Are you thinking in terms of dialysis? Are you thinking in terms of uh, uh, kidney transplant? Make the decision at the beginning and also end of life discussions. Check upon the patient's preferences. Ask the patient what symptom that the patient would want to uh, have relief more compared to another symptom that may be present. Look upon the state of burden that is acceptable by the patient and the family in order to achieve a status that they would want. Survival, cognition, pain, an important realm in management of our patients and in, and in the broader sense, quality of life. So elicit the preference, have a good understanding and communication. Are we making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same? Taught by our, uh, one of the uh, teachers in medicine, Hutchison. Coordinate the care, have a frequent clinical encounters and multiple serve with the multiple service providers in multiple disciplines. Have a multidisciplinary team approach. Have the humility to go and talk to the therapist, to the nurse, to the social care worker. You, you as a doctor, you need to be the captain of this uh, project, of this ship, and you must prevent it from sinking. Coordinated care is essential. A, thing, a concept that has come up uh, uh, in geriatrics is this comprehensive geriatric assessment, which where you have to assess the domains, the biopsychosocial domains of physical health, mental health, functional health, social environment. Regularly have meetings and reviews and formulate plans. Less may be better. Even I'm talking too much, but we have to know our limits. Are we giving too many medication? Are we per having more permissive targets, especially diabetes and hypertension? Are we thinking about life expectancy? There are uh, tools that are there available. Unfortunately, there are no evaluated tools in our part of the world, but Suomoto index is one which is which has some sort of uh, uh, account for uh, the racial aspect which you can uh, uh, substitute values in, in the online calculator and find out what kind of a prognosis that the patient would have. Are we taking the time to look at the patient's behet mallet, right? The brown bag test is an important test that you need to do. Look at the brown paper bag or the, the plastic bag that the patient may be bringing. See whether there is any duplication of medication. See whether there is a, a disintegrated medication or whether there is any expired medication. Regularly review the medication and see whether the patient requires this medication or the patient is just taking the medication for the sake of 
uh, taking it. Rationale prescription is important. Start low, go slow. Try to incorporate consolidation where you have fixed dosing schedules in morning, afternoon, and night, rather than going for four times a day or five times a day. Try to see whether you can address symptoms without any prescription. Sleep, change of sleep hygiene, incontinence by regular bladder care, reflux and edema. You may have to individualize conditions due to multimorbidity. As you know, there are certain instances you put my in myocardial infarction, COPD, if it's a younger person, a trial of cardioselective beta blockers may be used as many will uh, tolerate uh, this. But you need to see whether your patient, although it is there in guidelines, whether the patient, your patient is able to tolerate. So bring down those, those targets. Diabetes is one where your HbA1c should be, be reduced if the person is having multimorbidity. Don't stick to the value of 7 or 6.5, but the target of HbA1c of 8 is appropriate. Are we thinking whether insulin is appropriate in a person who is having cognitive or visual impairment? What about the risk of hypos? Are we checking kidney functions, electrolytes, in a more active way regularly when we do adjust the doses of our AC inhibitors and ARBs? Do we check the feet of our patients? In the same way, hypertension as well. You don't have to uh, uh, bring down the blood pressure uh, rapidly. Gradually bring it down to not, not more than 20 millimeters at a time and need to keep a baseline blood pressure which may be higher. The important thing is also comprehension. Use simple statistics, visual aids. Do not use things like number needed to treat and uh, sensitivity, etc. But use simple uh, statistics with you know fingers, countable numbers. Use a holistic approach. Take into account the personalized needs, preferences to treatment and health priorities and lifestyle. Also important that you need to get the patient into the center, agree upon an individualized management plan, come to the middle ground, rational prescription. Don't be scared to de-prescribe. We are not geared to that uh, behavior in our practice. We have not been taught. Learn how to remove unnecessary drugs. You may be a medical officer, you may be a consultant, Question yourself whether this drug is needed or not. Prioritize the healthcare encounters, coordinate the care, and regularly review the patient. I come back to our patients as a summary. We have, a, we have this 87-year-old gentleman who had extreme fatigue. He had ex extreme uh, dementia in the background of CCF, congestive cardiac failure, diabetes, uh, prostatism, and insomnia. He was on 14 drugs, and you see that his MMSC is dropping over the last six months, and he has extreme postural hypertension. He admits that he often forgets to take his evening medication, and there is tiredness. He doesn't want to check his blood sugar because his fingers hurt. We discussed with our patient, and the patient and the family, they said that they want to just keep the patient staying alive with a good quality of life and to reduce the unnecessary expenses on medication. Patient was on various nutraceuticals, vitamin, uh, sorry, uh, fish oil, uh, CoQ, CoQ enzyme, uh, et cetera, casting a huge burden upon the patient's uh, finances. So to reduce the expenses and to be safe at home. Safe at home, postural hypertension can be get falls and have deleterious effects. You see that in this patient, patient was on donopacil, doesn't show much uh, uh, in improvement when the, the MMSC is dropping so rapidly, and there is a modest success in delaying institutionalization and functional status. Patient was on uh, bone strengthening drugs, and you see that if somebody is having taking more than five years, uh, that the fracture protection risk extends to more than five years after stopping. Again, tight glycemic control has shown that it causes more harm than benefit. 
So a figure of 8 to 9% of HbA1c is acceptable. If we take this patient, his life expectancy was estimated to be few years, two to three years for his age and multimorbidity. And the cognitive decline will certainly go down two to three points over the next year or so. And he has extensive involvement of uh, activities of daily living. So for fatigue, what was uh, uh, attributable? There was bradycardia because of bisoprenol. Bisoprolol and donipacil combination. Patient was having uh, unstable glycemia with hypose because of the sulfonylureas and also the statin therapy, muscle pains. Insomnia was because of, again, the zolpidem not keeping asleep at night but causing daytime effects in this patient. Worsening heart failure, metformin. Um, should be avoided in extreme heart failure because of lactic acidosis, alendronate, the duration, and Alzheimer disease, zolpidem can worsen the dementia. So we communicated and discussed the de de uh, decisions with the patient, and we made a rational prescription of reducing the bisoprolol to once a day and to uh, uh, reduce uh, and to uh, reduce the zolpidem to five milligrams nocte or as, as needed. Stop the donopicil in the morning because it was not causing any improvement. Heart failure, we agreed to consolidate drugs to the morning doses. The frusamide, the nilapril and the bisoprolol only in the morning. And to uh, uh, change the patient into memantine, which uh, if, the, uh, if the patient required a drug for uh, reduction of uh, the dementia worsening. So our targets were reduced uh, as we mentioned, and we stopped alendronate and we stopped statin as there was uh, poor prognosis and uncertain benefit with the extreme age. And we had advocated pill boxes to be uh, filled weekly to give clear, simple instructions for use with a regular review. I end with this quote, the good physician treats the disease. Are we at least trying to become a great physician by treating the patient who has the disease? That is my prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shyam Silva. Uh, it's time for any questions now, please. Can you see. may pull in questions from microphone uh, from uh, your end, or you can uh, certainly uh, uh, pose in your questions through the chat box. The, uh, with regard to the bleeding PR, now, uh, is Kesar available? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Now, um, Generally, I mean, in, from our end, what we see is more often uh, an elderly who is anemic. And more often, they may not complain, actually, bleeding PR. Uh, so how, how uh, do you think that in that type of a situation, that is it, should it be routine that we examine for hemorrhoids? Uh, Yes, so uh, so iron deficiency anemia per se is, I mean, if there is, uh, it's an indication for an upper G endoscopy and colonoscopy. Ideally, now if you take in the UK, um, the patients presenting who are found to have iron deficiency anemia will invariably go on a on a, 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 a fast track pathway to have a upper G and a colonoscopy done by a colorectal team. So now that is not, I mean, that facility is not available here. However, uh, certainly in the, if you have a patient with iron deficiency anemia, you need to first do a digital rectal examination and a proctoscopy that, that is mandatory. And then um, iron deficiency anemia per se would indicate a upper GI and a colonoscopy to look for a source. Of course, in an elderly patient, um, that may be a little tricky because the tolerance for a, for the bowel preparation and the colonoscopy may be tricky, especially in patients over the age of 75, the complication rates also can be slightly higher than the other population. So it can be a problem. So one of the alternatives that can be used is to do a CT virtual cologram, 
but these are all high end things which may or may not be practical in a government setting or in a you know in a peripheral hospital so the other thing that can be done is to do a fecal occult blood um if i mean if you see hemorrhoids fine but then uh, other if there are no hemorrhoids then you need you can go for a uh, fecal occult blood or what we call fecal immuno testing uh, or pyruvate kinase test which will uh, detect any occult blood in the stool um but um, in you know in a practical day to day scenario in the clinic i think uh, if you have a patient with iron deficiency anemia certainly do a digital rectal examination and at least a coprostopy uh, and if you feel that there is some ongoing problem discuss you can discuss with your surgeon um for further uh, endoscopic assistance Okay, sir. So is uh, the pyruvate kinase test available in the government setup? Uh, I, I, we know that it's available in the private sector, but uh, is it available in at least in the teaching hospitals? No, not on a not on a sort of a widespread uh, note. I think uh, Colombo South might be having it, but I think they are running a, sort of like a trial to go look at it as a possibility for colorectal screening. But I'm not hundred percent sure that. But it's not certainly not um, widely available. I have a question uh, for Dr. Padma Gunaratnam, um, Madam. Uh, uh, in acute stroke, what at what particular point uh, do we talk about rehabilitation? We are thinking about thrombolysis and all these things in uh, reducing the ischemic penumbra. Uh, coming from my uh, presentation about the biopsychosocial approach, uh, when does physical rehabilitation? Uh, when has it to be begun? And uh, also psychological rehabilitation. See, uh, now actually, uh, once the patient has come, see if the patient came in the very acute stage, you thrombolyze and patient may be sent to the intensive care unit so that patient would be in the intensive care unit for 24 hours and then come out of the intensive care unit. Or if the patient is in a very serious situation, continue to be intensive care. Unit. But then majority may not need intensive care unit and they may come to, they have to be managed in the stroke unit, though we do not have facility everywhere. So from that point onwards is rehabilitation actually. It is uh, uh, from the acute stage itself because, I mean, the nurse's contribution for rehabilitation is enormous. So as the patient comes within first 24 hours itself, the nurse has to check for swallowing before we give anything via mouth, oral, uh, uh, the nurse has to check for uh, swallowing. So the actually for any of the hospital, I mean, I don't think that the it is thrombolysis that we need to pay attention immediately. I mean, to, 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 uh, to it's true that the government has provided uh, with this, uh, the treatment, which is so much expensive. But the, if we could streamline the rehabilitation from acute stage still, uh, there is so much that uh, these patients, so for any hospital that if they could streamline the acute management of stroke itself that we do so much of a service for stroke patients. It, it is from the acute stage itself that we would uh, uh, start rehabilitation. Uh, what about physical therapy? Because there is a lot of uh, uh, sort of maybe misconception, but or maybe varied ways of uh, the therapists, uh, physiotherapists engaging in these uh, therapeutic sessions. Uh, when does active physical therapy, when should it uh, start? Uh, it again has to be individualized huh? because uh, now, say, if you ask the physiotherapist what his responsibilities are, his responsibility includes some one thing is the chest physiotherapy as well as the physical for limb the, uh, get to get the patient for limb physiotherapy, get in the patient to sit up and then sit up by the side of the bed and then to stand and then walking and then required physiotherapy for upper limbs. So based on what the disability is, say if the patient has the risk of aspiration or if the patient is with the, the respiration is threatened, then initially it would be the chest physiotherapy and passive physiotherapy, and that would be from the acute stage. Only problem is that, say, for certain category of patients, maybe with cardiac uh, involvement, so that uh, until the patient's cardiac status is well evaluated, uh, one may not consider active physiotherapy a lot if you suspect the patient to have a cardiac problem. But if otherwise, there's no time. And also if the patient is with severe 
particularly a lower hemorrhage type of a fairly big hemorrhage. Then again, active physiotherapy in the acute stage uh, may not be that much recommended. I don't think that there is data for that. But the practice is that you don't get a lot of active physiotherapy for cerebral hemorrhages in the very acute stage. But still, they need passive physiotherapy. So there is no time. I mean, from early stages, still the physiotherapist has to work. And uh, practice had been that not to do much active physiotherapy if the patient's cardiac condition does not warrant, or if the patient is with uh, a fairly uh, big uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, yeah, Krishna, now you said uh, for thrombolysis, you have this time interval of 4.5 to 5.5, that the door to needle time. Is there any particular time after which you consider that you know it will be of no use and uh, dismiss the patient? Yeah, uh, the things are getting more and more complicated. See, so the initially the benefits were shown up to three three uh, hours. So that to get the best out of the treatment, you have to give it as early as possible, maybe within first ninety minutes or at least within three hours. The number needed to treat, if you treat within three hours, is much lower than if you treat from three to 4.5 hours. So from four, up to 4.5 hours, you could thrombolize from Monset. Say, if you do not uh, uh, thrombolize within 4.5 hours, the other possible way to thrombolize is the use of what the technology. So you, the technology helps you to differentiate penumbra from infarcted tissue. Both the CT, advanced CT technology and MRI technology helps you. So for an instance, if a patient wakes up in the morning, you just do not know the time of onset. Or if a patient is with severe dysphasia, patient will not be able to tell you the time of onset. So in that type of a situation, Say if we, I mean, I just do not think that the, we use in this country this advanced CT technology for management, but definitely we have MRIs. So in MRIs, you are you have a lot of uh, varying resolutions, varying forms of films that they do. One, two important types of films are the diffusion weighted imaging and the flare images. So in the diffusion, all the time, if you suspect the patient to have a stroke, we say that please do a DW image. So if your DW image shows changes and if player does not show the changes, then again, that indicates that there is viable cerebral tissue ischemia. So in that type of situation, from the time that you recognize that is the time that you woke up, up to 4.5 hours till you could thrombolize that patient. We now uh, conclude this uh, session, uh, the first session of this uh, regional clinical meeting. And uh, I would like to invite you again to kindly uh, log on by 11 o'clock. Uh, uh, we will be starting the second session and uh, the controls will be given to uh, Dr. Sanat and his team uh, to uh, go on with the proceedings. Thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, good morning to uh, both teams uh, from SLMA and the Chilau team. Uh, I'm Dr. Sanat Fernandu, uh, the Chilau Clinical Society President. Uh, I would introduce uh, my uh, co-moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Sundar Lingam Rishike Savan. He's the consultant chest physician at uh, our hospital. Uh, so over to you, Rishi. Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Sundarikam Prashikeshav and a consultant physician. I'd like to introduce our first speaker from outside, our colleague, uh, Dr. Chantika Spasinga, who will be addressing about diabetic during the COVID-19. She's a consultant endocrinologist at TJ Chilo. She had her education from Dharmasoka College, Pambalangoda, and she graduated from University of Colombo. She completed her foreign training in uh, 50 NHS Foundation Plus UK. She had called MBBS, MD, and MRC. Uh, she had published more than 20 papers in peer reviewed local and international journals, has presented research work and done invited lectures, local and national scientific forms, had won distinction, gold medals, and awards 
in undergraduate as well as PG career and won several research and other awards. Over to you, Dr. Chanjika. Good morning to you all. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Rishi, for kind words of introduction. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka Society for inviting me to uh, speak on this timely topic, COVID-19 and diabetes. So let me share my slides with you. Uh, Okay, so COVID-19 and diabetes, when we take this uh, disease, these are not uh, just a combination of two diseases. Uh, we, we call it, it's a meeting of two major pandemics, which has caused significant uh, uh, health effects and other effects to the humankind. So, uh, so COVID-19 pandemic, let's first go to the infectious pandemic. Uh, so in uh, March to 2020, WHO announced COVID-19 as a global pandemic. Since then it has caused uh, impact on all the aspects of uh, the living. Uh, and uh, so this is the latest update from the COVID dashboard. So there's 2.4 million deaths reported and more than 100 million cases reported uh, by yesterday. So let's look at the virology of, of this SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So it is a beta type uh, uh, coronavirus, mRNA virus. It has a lipid bilayer uh, decorated by uh, protein spikes. And with these protein spikes, uh, the uh, virus get attached to the angiotensin converting to a uh, receptor and enters into the cell through endocytosis and get replicated and uh, causes the clinical effects and uh, also the, uh, the spread. So this infectious pandemics has not been a, a new thing to us, to the human history. There had been, we ha it had been a common companion of us uh, for millions of years. So this is a, a kind of a summary of uh, the uh, history of pandemics. So one unique thing about these things is uh, whatever dangerous they were, we got rid of these uh, pandemics over several years of time. So uh, we hope that the same thing will happen with the COVID-19 as well. And uh, we have the vaccine, we will develop immunity and we will uh, get back to the near normal or the normal in the near future, hopefully. So let's look at the other pandemic. So the pandemic of non-communicable diseases or diabetes. So even though you and uh, me don't feel it uh, as COVID-19, uh, but this diabetes prevalence also had been rising over many decades in a slow pace, not like the COVID. And it will be going on uh, to increase in prevalence in next uh, generations, uh, in uh, multiple generations as well. So this is the latest update on the International Diabetes Federation World Diabetes Map. If you look at that, by 2000, end of 2019, there were 400, 463 million uh, diabetes cases all over the world. And it is predicted by 2045, it will be 700 million. But with the things happen during this 2020, 2021 with the COVID, the changes in the lifestyle and everything, we can expect that the, the, this prediction, we will exceed this uh, 700 million more sooner than 2045. And look at Southeast Asia, the tiny region in the world map. So already one fifth of uh, diabetes adults living in this area. And the rise is uh, in a rapid pace than the rest of the world. We expect 75% increase in the uh, next 25 years. And uh, the, we know the COVID-19 hit the rich and poor in the same way. America was hit uh, very badly, but uh, the non-communicable diseases and diabetes hit the poor and low-income countries in, uh, in a uh, worse way than the rich. So let's look at the prevalence of uh, diabetes in Sri Lanka. Uh, so we don't have very good data. This is a promise study conducted by a group of endocrinologists in 2015 in a low income uh, area in Colombo, uh, uh, area. So they found the prevalence of diabetes to be 27% and the pre-diabetes 30%. 
but Chilla has a mixed socioeconomic background. So this may be less than that, uh, but we, the, the prevalence is very high. Just a side note for the people who are studying for exams, the diagnostic cutoffs of diabetes and pre-diabetes, okay? Right. So let's see what happens when these two things, the COVID-19 and diabetes come together and in a battle. Right, so if you are a diabetic patient, what do you think? Are you at high risk of uh, developing COVID-19 infection? The infectivity, is it high in you? So if you ask me that question, I, I, I will think, yes, it is possible because you have poor innate immunity. Your first line defense for why, uh, tackling with virus is poor. And you have more AC2 uh, receptors expression because you are hypertensive on AC inhibitors and et cetera. And the theoretically, it is possible that you are at high risk. But the, what, what, what is available data says is, it says that there is no uh, significant increase in uh, the diabetes prevalence in the uh, diabetes, uh, COVID uh, cohorts when compared to the general population. This is, uh, I think the, there's food for thought, even though the data says like that, it may not be the true picture because we advise the NCD diabetes patients from the very beginning to not to get exposed to the virus. That may be the reason why the, 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 the diabetes prevalence in COVID-19 uh, uh, cohorts are as same as general population. But on the other way, that's a good news that the infection rate, uh, the, the risk of infection is not higher than general population in diabetes. Okay, so if, if, if you as a diabetes patient, if you get COVID-19, if your patient get COVID-19, what is the risk of developing severe disease and mortality? Definitely the, the uh, research and everything has proven diabetes patients are at high risk of severe disease and high mortality rates. Right? So why that happens? If you look at the diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, it comes with a, a package of risk factors. Most of our type 2 diabetes patients are obese, they have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, CKD, dyslipidemia, and what's the pathology going on inside them? They have chronic inflammation, they have insulin in, um, resistance, they are in a pro-coagulable state, state uh, thrombotic state in a chronic phase. So when the uh, COVID comes and hit them, this process get augmented and you get high, uh, the severe disease and high mortality. So in molecular level, so I, I'm not going to explain everything in this, uh, the comprehensive uh, diagram, but this shows in molecular level what happens and how these process are get, uh, get augmented with these two conditions when they come together and cause severe disease and high mortality. Right, so unfortunately you are diabetes and if you get di uh, COVID-19, what decides the, your survival and whether you are going to develop severe disease and whether you are going to die? So the, the research has shown that the, uh, the hyperglycemia on the admission, the glycemic control is a main factor which decide what's going to happen to you. So, uh, so research has used different cutoffs, HbA1c more than 10, uh, the blood glucose more than 10 millimoles. In all these research, they have shown in even in type two diabetes, type one diabetes, the, the severity of the disease and the mortality had been high at the poor glycemic control. So, so our target uh, should be to uh, achieve a good glycemic control in uh, diabetic COVID-19 patients. So we can use the same drugs, but some drugs should be used in caution and some uh, drugs should not be used in hospitalized critically ill patients. So uh, kind of, I'm not an expert in uh, managing critically ill uh, COVID patients, even having diabetes. So I'm not going to explain these things, but the, uh, the guideline says how to use these. There are guidelines developing and a glycemic target, same as for uh, usual uh, diabetes patients. For the critically ill patients, we, uh, we say that 140 to 180 is our glycemic target. So this has not been kind of 
the people adhere with this uh, for even critically ill COVID patients. So other than diabetes, not only diabetes, if you have hyperglycemia, irrespective of you are having diabetes or not, has been identified as an independent risk factor for severe disease. So can we have hyperglycemia without diabetes? Yes, we can have. Especially with the acute illness, you can develop hyperglycemia as a response to this immune process going on. So uh, they have seen the COVID-19 admission, COVID-19 admissions. They have seen the increased rates of hyperglycemia. So they have categorized these patients into three groups, pre-existing diabetes, new onset diabetes, the new onset diabetes can be there. They develop diabetes at this point, or it can be uh, the unmasking of pre-existing non-undiagnosed diabetes. And there's another category, hyperglycemia with no diabetes. So these two, low, uh, the last two categories, differentiation is very difficult, but for research purposes, ADA use the HPA1C, high and low as the differentiating uh, mark for that. So uh, there's, a, uh, the, there's a thought that the COVID virus itself can induce hyperglycemia and diabetes. They think that ACE, ACE receptors are there in the pancreatic cells. And when the virus gets attached to that, it can cause beta cell damage. Insulin secretion can go down. And also these virus can attach to the lipid cells and the skeletal muscle and can increase the insulin resistance and can cause hyperglycemia whatsoever. What are the theories behind what's happening? Um, maybe kind of, we don't know exactly, but hyperglycemia is an independent predictor of severe disease and mortality. Okay, so that's uh, what I said was, what can happen to the COVID-19 patient if you have diabetes? Now let's talk, what is the outcome of diabetes patient or what is the future of diabetes patient being in this COVID era, right? So other than the virus itself and the infection itself, a lot of things change in our lifestyle, in our living over these two years. The, there are lockdowns, the way we learn, way we uh, take our medicine, how do we do our job and everything changed and all the time. Uh, and there is another topic, COVID and depression and mental stress. All these changes happen around us uh, other than the virus itself had, uh, has a, a massive effect on diabetes uh, management and its future. So as I uh, previously said, uh, said to you, new onset diabetes is a thought uh, which may be related to uh, the COVID virus. We know the virus can precipitate onset of any autoimmune process. So autoimmune diabetes, uh, people think whether it, it can precipitate. And uh, we, we are, uh, it's too early for us to comment on that. There are international groups who are going to study on this in follow-up. And, but we can say that the, there will be prevalence of type two diabetes and other forms of diabetes will be rising because of the lifestyle changes happened during this period. Okay, so uh, looking at the data, diabetes mortality rates has gone up in the COVID-19 era not only COVID related deaths, but COVID unrelated diabetes deaths has also gone up due to obvious reasons, right? And the hyperglycemic emergencies in COVID era has gone up. People think the virus itself can be responsible. And also even in non-infected patients, uh, being, uh, because of the unavailability of drugs, unavailability of the insulin, poor drug compliance, uh, inability to reach medical care, and all these things, and less monitoring has caused increased rates of hyperglycemic emergencies. Right, so what happened to the glycemic control in our patients in COVID era? Again, you may be experiencing it now, the glycemic control has become poor, so this is a study from Wuhan, China, during their major lockdown, they, they showed uh, that 75% of type 2 diabetes, 65% of type 1 diabetes had poor glycemic control during the lockdown. 
Okay, so how are we going to manage diabetes? So if you're in a diabetic clinic, if you're seeing diabetes patients, how are going to how you are going to manage your diabetes patient during this COVID era? So the same principles apply, the lifestyle modification, weight management should go on, drug management should be optimal. You should screen and prevent complications of diabetes, reduce the cardiovascular risk. So you know the lifestyle modification and weight loss can prevent diabetes in pre-diabetes patients. And also, if you apply proper weight loss in early diabetes, you can uh, induce uh, diabetes remission. You might know about the uh, direct study which shows very good evidence. So the healthy lifestyle, first is the diet. So we usually introduce the plate model for diabetes patients. So we should uh, emphasize them the importance of adhering to this plate model. So there were challenges in the uh, lockdowns. Availability of food was not uh, very good and your economical status was not superb. So, but still, as a uh, with the available resources, you must try to adhere to this healthy plate. And the healthy lifestyle, the exercise has changed. The regular exercise, physical activities, step in per day has gone down, and your sedentary behavior has got uh, worse during the uh, pandemic. So you should try to engage in aerobic exercise at least 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week. Uh, muscle strengthening exercises, and at the same time, you should try to minimize the sedentary time. Okay, so the drug management. So this is the ADA algorithm for choosing uh, the, uh, the hypoglycemic medications for your uh, patient. So there is no big difference. You, you don't have to change your prescription pattern in diabetes because of having COVID. So first line therapy, metformin and lifestyle. And then second line therapy, we choose based on the individual factors of the patient. The patient is having uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, CKD, then you choose the second line. And if not, uh, with the, what is your target? Minimizing hypoglycemia, weight loss, or the cost, like in our case, in our hospitals. So based on that, you have to choose your medication, but uh, because of the cost, we use sulfonylurea as the second line, that's all fine. So we can end here with this prescription pattern. So what we have to advise our patient is to continue the prescribed uh, medication with good compliance. So these are the recommendations uh, for uh, management of diabetes in COVID era. So this says the uninfected patients in the COVID environment, we can use almost all medications but we should use STLT2 inhibitors and sulfonylurea with caution because you know sulfonylurea in acute illness can cause hypoglycemia. I'll talk about the STLT2 inhibitors. So I think uh, without talking about STLT2 inhibitors, the diabetes talk is not complete these days. So we know it causes uh, controlled diabetes by causing glucosuria. And other than uh, uh, glycemic control, it has many good effects. It's uh, good for the heart, kidney, reduce blood pressure, reduce uh, the uh, body weight, but it has its own side effects. So you we should pick it very uh, with uh, for the proper patients, uh, and it is expensive in our setting as well. So what what what, what is special about SGLT2 inhibitors? So you know. The SGLT2 inhibitors are empagliflozine, canagliflozine, dapagliflozine. What is special here? So in stress or in acute illness, uh, when we use SGLT2 inhibitors with the stress, it can precipitate something called euglycemic diabetes ketoacidosis, right? Because it causes hypoglycemia, it uh, changes the balance between insulin and glucagon, and it uh, causes increased ketone reabsorption. Because of that, they can develop glycemic decay. So, so in this era, in 
uninfected patients, if, if, if your patient is on STLT2 inhibitors, you can continue it. You can start it on your patients, but you have to advise them. If you become acutely ill, critically ill, please discuss with your medical team regarding continuation of the medication. And abrupt withdrawal also can cause hyperglycemia, which is an independent risk factor, right? Okay. So other than taking your medication, you should monitor your glucose. So for uh, during last few months, we sent medications to the uh, home, but most of the patients did not monitor their blood glucose. So only thing is like we, the people who can afford should have a glucometer at home and they should monitor their glucose at home. So we have to empower self-monitoring of the blood glucose at least among affordable people. And there should be a mechanism from our clinic. We can uh, let our patients to borrow glucometers uh, if needed, right? So the empowering self-monitoring is very important. The next thing is the prevention and management of complications, cardiovascular risk reduction. Most of our diabetes patients die of cardiovascular disease, MIO stroke. So you have to maintain good glycemic control, control BP, statin, stop smoking, healthy lifestyle, all these things. And the neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy, which, uh, diabetes, food complications, we should not forget. And the patient should be empowered to monitor themselves at home. And uh, like we have to have uh, programs to monitor them even during the COVID data. So I'll stop my talk with the story of Mr. Pereira. Uh, so he's a 70 year old retired clerk living alone, diabetes for more than 20 years and had neuropathy, nephro, uh, retinopathy. And he, COVID came and he took all precautions to prevent, prevent COVID-19, had good diet, did the exercise and did some gardening. And one day he had a cut injury in the foot, but his uh, son was in quarantine uh, his neighbors just returned after COVID treatment, so he didn't want to uh, talk to them. And then he uh, did some home remedies, and after five days, developed high fever, getting to the hospital, ended up with four foot amputation. So, one thing COVID precautions versus COVID phobia. So, we have to educate the patient on COVID pre precautions, but has to advise them when to reach the medical care, what are the emergencies, what are the urgencies, otherwise COVID phobia also can kill you and you can lo lose your foot because of that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, Chandrika, for a wonderful uh, talk on uh, COVID and diabetes. Uh, I have one question for you, Chandrika. Uh, as a as the VPOPD, uh, I had uh, a lot of uh, reductions in the patients uh, with diabetes and all the patients uh, to our clinic. Yeah. What was your experience uh, during this uh, COVID uh, uh, with diabetes? Yeah, definitely the, the, there is a major elderly population also within this uh, diabetes patient. And from the very beginning, we educated them not to get exposed to uh, uh, the COVID because of high risk of severe disease. And uh, this, I think there's a part of COVID phobia as well in that. And they didn't come to the hospital. Still, we don't see uh, the uh, usual numbers coming to the clinic. And we posted medications, but they didn't have the feel of uh, controlling diabetes as when they were coming to the clinic. So these, everything affected their drug compliance. And we are seeing now a lot of uh, patients with poor glycemic control and new complications. So, we should have in our clinic level uh, a program, uh, some uh, the long term uh, thought, uh, how to get down these patients, how, how to reach them through telephone or whatever, and uh, ask them to use the COVID precautions with that, uh, use the medical care wisely, and come to the medical care when there is emergency or urgency without the delay. Uh, uh... We managed to uh, do some uh, research on that. Uh, I mean, uh, from our clinic, uh, we managed to uh, uh, search some patients uh, with uh, over the phone calls. 
uh, and we realized that uh, during the lockdown period, some people had actually uh, did not come to the hospital with complications with, uh, with uh, heart attack, myocardial infarction. Some people have actually passed away. Uh, and uh, the others are actually frightened to come to the clinic. Uh, we see a very less number as well with regard to other problems as well. I think in the, by 2022-2023, we will be seeing a lot of patients with yeah. new yes. complications, complications and increased prevalence and new ones at that as well. Right. Thank you, Chandrika. Right. Thank you for Thank you. the presentation. And uh, so during this uh, COVID uh, outbreak, we have faced lots of uh, psychological stress. Uh, so I'm now going to invite uh, our uh, consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Arjuna Alepole, to speak on the mental health during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Alepole is a consultant psychiatrist and uh, had his education from Malia Deva College, Purnagala. Uh, he's a graduate of the uh, University of Peradeniya. Uh, he had his foreign training at Metro South Mental Health uh, in Queensland, Australia. He holds uh, MBBS and MD. He had some research papers uh, to his name presented at various clinical sessions. Over to you, Dr. Arjuna. I'm Arjuna Lepo, psychiatrist at Chilam Hospital. And uh, when uh, Sanat asked, Dr. Sanat Fernando asked me to discuss about something psychiatric related topic during the sessions, I thought of talking about COVID because it is something that all of us get some sort of exposure this year. So I put my topic as COVID and mental health. During my talk, I will uh, talk about few major things. The first thing I will talk about what is mental health and what is mental illness. Then I will talk about uh, the phenomena of uh, COVID or the phenomena of uh, quarantine fatigue. Then I talk about certain case scenarios, few patients we saw during the last few months, and then what are the coping strategies to contract COVID, then few things that we do not talk about. This is the first slide. Actually, if you consider the concept of mental health and mental illness, I think you most of you will know the difference. Mental illness is having a mental disorder, for example, you know what is schizophrenia, what is depression, what is anxiety, having a mental illness is called, having a mental disorder is called having a mental illness and it, is, it comes under the concept of mental illness, but mental health is the broader concept where we talk about mental well-being. A person can be an individual with good mental health, it does not mean that someone who has a who does not have a mental illness necessarily to be a person with good mental health. So mental illness is different and mental health is different. So this is the definition of mental health according to WHO, state of well-being in which the individual realizes his abilities and can cope with stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So I think you got clear the definitions, having a better appropriate healthy mental health is different from not having mental illness. Okay. So with respect to COVID, we see several patients with different types of mental illnesses. Now, as you all know, mental illnesses, can be contributed. For example, the COVID can contribute to mental illnesses in different ways. For example, COVID can be a stressor. At the same time, people might have compliance issues during COVID climate. For example, they might not have the access to the hospital, they might not have access to the medications, and they might not have access to service. Sometimes due to the stressor, they might forget their medications and there can be difficulties in getting the depot medications, the injections, and as a result, there can be compliance issues and people who are on treatment for mental illnesses can get relapses or 
can get their fitness condition worsened during COVID time. And as I told earlier, we need to talk about two, two concepts here. One is cabin fever. It is not an illness, so it is not a diagnosis. It is a phenomena that was described in 1800s AD. And it is, if you read through this, you can understand cabin fever is a phenomena that occurs when someone is stuck inside for a protracted period of time unable to get outside into fresh air or interact with other humans. The oldest known use of the term cabin fever to mean a type of claustrophobic claustrophobia caused by being forced into a period of isolation occurred in early 1900s. It seems to have originated in North America and so on. So, so this concept of cabin fever surfaces again during the pandemic as quarantine fatigue. It is all. It is also referred as pandemic fatigue, and the features are like this: quarantine fatigue, go, pandemic fatigue, go, cabin fever. These are the features. The features are mainly anxiety and depression related, distressing feelings as a result of strict isolation. This is the part. We are the, we are, this is the part that makes the person distressed because he's in isolation. He has limited access to outside and he's restricted to a place, for example, like during in quarantine, altered sleep wake cycle, craving for food, anxiety symptoms. I think you all know anxiety symptoms. We might get somatic symptoms like uh, tachycardia, then palpitation, sweating, then dryness of mouth multiple symptoms related to anxiety, then depressive features, for example, disturbed sleep, disturbed appetite, then feeling sad, worthlessness, ideas of self harm then other symptoms like poor concentration, irritability, fatigue. So all these symptoms are part of the phenomena of quarantine fatigue. And this is what we see during the COVID time, even though these symptoms do not amount to a mental illness. So many people come for services asking different types of remedies for these symptoms. And now I talk about how do we feel better when someone comes with quarantine fatigue, when someone comes with features of anxiety or depression during COVID time, what are the strategies we help them to get rid of these symptoms? These are not specific to COVID or not specific to quarantine fatigue. These are basic activities that help people to get rid of their anxiety or their distress. You might know most of these strategies, for example, outdoor activities. People can go outside, then people can involve themselves in outdoor activities, for example, some sort of playing, even walking outside, gardening, that type of activities that do not make their quarantine, that do not make, make them break their quarantine limits. Then normal eating pattern. Sometimes people, they have hyperphagia, they eat more. Sometimes they even do not eat adequate amount. So people are advised, patients are advised to maintain normal eating patterns. Then physical exercise that is very important. We all know mental health is associated with physical exercise. When we have adequate exercise, when we exercise properly, it helps us to maintain good mental health. Relaxation. There are different types of activities. Commonly, we teach our patients like uh, controlled breathing, then visual imagery that type of exercises to relax themselves. Then other activities to structure their day and socialize. Now socialize in the sense here, people can get socialized using social media because due to this uh, quarantine issues and due to limitations of their contacts, we can't talk about socialization like we used to do earlier, but there are certain limits and socializing can occur can be practiced with 
social media for people who are capable of doing socialization via social media we invest into so right so these are the ways few methods or few strategies for people to feel better when they have features of distress during a pandemic or in the specific situation during the covid climate and i think i have come to the end of the first few slides so i talk about what is mental disorder what is uh, mental health what is mental illness what is the phenomena of cabin fever and what is phenomena of quarantine fatigue and how do we counteract how do we advise people to get rid of these symptoms then i will talk about few individuals or few patients i saw recently who have parts or he have who have aspects related to covid this is the this is one of the ladies i saw yesterday and she was in her 60s and what happened was one of her relatives a close relative got covid and as a result she and her family they were home quarantined and during the quarantine she started to get fear that she will get covid as well as her children then towards the end of the quarantine she started getting different pains and aches she started getting pain of her throat and had difficulty in swallowing and ultimately what happened was she was admitted to the hospital and after admission she became pcr negative all the investigations they would not substantiate anything related to covid or any other illness and all the investigations were within normal range and she was discharged even after this charge she had the same symptoms at the same time her functional level deteriorated and when she came to me yesterday she was depressed and she was treated for depression and she is in treatment and this is one example how a lady in the 60s got depression that is related to covid then the second patient this is this patient i saw about few months ago she was a girl in her late teens i think 16 or 15 and she was admitted to the hospital following the act of poisoning and when the history was developed it was found the father was a person who was dependent on substances specifically he was dependent on opioids and during that time during the first uh, wave of covid he was arrested and after the arrest this patient her mother and two siblings they were trying to release him on bail but what what happened ultimately was they could not find the amount of money to get him released on bail so the girl was so much distressed with the other financial difficulties and all the other problems she was suffering from features of depression and she attempted to harm herself and she was admitted to hospital and this is the second person i would like to describe you who had conceived cancers related to covid here in that patient the loss of father then he was he got arrested then there's no income there's income insecurity then economic downturn and the distress of not having the father and depression and anxiety made her to take can to take the poison so those two patients now there are so many other patients you have also might have also seen it can be a person who did not have a psychiatric illness before it can be a person who had a psychiatric illness before who can get a relapse or who can get a freshly onset psychiatric illness associated no need to go then the two other individuals i talked about in next few slides are both of them are teenage individuals and they tackled though they adjusted to covid in different manner these two got one had the deliberate self harm other got depressed and this is the first girl she was in her 15 she was 15 years of age and this is the story told to by told to me by her mother 
and she started learning german schools were closed this girl was at home she had limited activities to do and she went to a website and she started a course to learn german and this online course helped her to learn german and within few months time she acquired reasonable knowledge about german and she started to monitor her progress and she still continues learning german so this is something we do not expect but if you see the situation you can understand how different type of people take the same stressor in different ways the first one she took a poison the second girl she started to learn german during the pandemic so there are individual differences how people react to stress the fourth one she's all he's uh, in her in his 17 a 17 year old boy she started he started writing book reviews there are different websites they actually they pay for selected book reviews and this boy who is very keen on reading has a good english knowledge and he started writing reviews for this website and they have selected several of his reviews to publish and he had earned some money as well during the covid so this is how four people reacted to covid and this same stressor in different manners the fourth one this is a lady in her 30s and her son he attends to a ukg class in a nursery and she had difficulties in keeping her children at home because she had to take care of the children there had been difficulties in child caring because schools were closed and what she did was she discussed to persuaded her colleagues or friends and this specific school they had a poll to find out which classes to start physically and they ran this vote and if you can go through this during the uh, for the lkg classes 70% of parents said not to start classes but for the ukg it's the total opposite 87% said yes so this lady was in the ukg parents group and she persuaded the friends and ultimately they managed to open the classes the physical classes for her son and other students and she managed to send the son to school and as a result she got rid of the stress of taking care of the child at home so if you go through this if you remember the four scenario the five scenarios i mentioned the first two they got psychiatric illnesses so they got negative type of reactions or negative type of adjustments to the covid then the third and fourth they had uh, this five five individuals they reacted to the covid in different ways then even covid in within next few months or next few years we will be facing to the short term and long term implications of mental health some people are they are still at the beginning of vaccination it is slow to roll out then some are fearing of vaccination and at the same time the financial burdens and financial crisis continue so i don't think we will end there will be a end there will be an end for the covid related mental problems mental illnesses or mental health issues immediately but we might probably we will be facing them in the next few years to come the last bit of my presentation i will talk about few things that we very rarely talk about now we talk about non communicable diseases and we talk about people dying of covid people who dying of consequences so the effects of covid but very rarely we talk about smoking so this is something i think 
we should start talking about smoking doubles the mortality risk of covid-19 the meta analysis of recent reports in potential mechanisms now in sri lanka also we know roughly about 50 people die due to smoking related issues daily and commonality is believed that about 10 years the life expectancy of a person who smokes is nearly 10 years less than someone who does not smoke so maybe due to normalization of smoking as well as alcohol or maybe due to the influence of the industry as medical professionals i think we need to start talking about smoking and alcohol more and more during this covid time because it is something we can help people we can help them to stop or quit behavior so we should take the advantage at this time even if we can ask when a patient comes to us do you smoke if you smokes this is the possibility you might have higher risk of dying from covid if we put that doubt into our doubt into our, if we can put this doubt into our patients ultimately it will help to help to quit at least few patients individually by stopping their unnecessary habits then the other thing i want to talk about this is few number of few statistics about our mcclear clinic this is the number of patients who attended our clinic during covid time and three past years now i have included the number of patients number of follow up patients came to our clinic during january of 2018 during january of 2019 during january of 2020 and during january of 2021 now until covid it was around 1200 plus but during the covid time it was this january this last month the total number of attendants to the clinic were 483 then if you consider the last month that was december 2020 we had only 433 patients but during last two years it was similarly equal to january it was 1200 plus so what i feel what we felt was even though the number of patients who came to the clinics were less we did not see that much of a rise of admissions or relapses now there's a sharp decrease about three times reduction of number of patients attended to the clinic but that much of increase of admissions or relapses we did not see so i think we need to find out actually what is happening are patients taking their medications properly are family members supporting the patients to take their medications properly and are they taking care of them more than they used to take care of or do patients wait at homes with relapse of illnesses rather than coming to the hospital so i think this is something we need to find out in next few months because do the number of patients coming to the clinic reduced we did not see that much of increase of relapses so and so those are the two things i want you to think are we addressing alcohol and tobacco during this covid time to perdi what are the factors that might have contributed for patients having mental illnesses at their home so i think we will find the reasons or we will find that maybe multifactorial we will find the reasons in near future and that is what i want to talk about and thank you for listening to me and uh, if you have any questions i am happy to give my answers yes madam yes madam i can hear you yeah yeah thank you for the interesting talk the uh, um initially i i i wanted to find out initially of course uh with regard to ethics and uh, this thing we will talk on that by later but then uh, now when you say you have 400 out for two months or we have not finished even two months uh won't you think that then for the year that it would be more than last years yes but now that is what i initially thought that the effects of covid we might see 
increase of number of patients or increase number of lapses in next few months to come. But at the moment, at the moment we see a reduction, a sharp reduction in number of patients that into the clinic. But I think with the consequences, for example, the financial crisis, the other problems of their compliance, and there's a there's a possibility that they will increase. I I agree with you. So probably that they may not be coming, no? Yeah, that is possible, madam. That is possible. That is possible. Uh, other things also, I think we need to think whether, I think sometimes the relatives might be, relatives might be supporting them more than usual, but that, uh, that might contribute them to stay at home, even minor increase of their illnesses. So even minor relapses, sometimes they may be staying at home rather than coming to hospital. But Usually when they get aggressive or when they get violent, uh, the relatives don't keep them at home. They bring them to the hospital. But that type of uh, that type of relapses, we have not seen that much during last few months. What I wanted to ask you was that whether yeah. you came across, uh, now initially because the COVID was something new to our community say, if you think that it's even to doctors, uh, even to allied health, and uh, even to media, the, there was no adherence to much of ethics in the initial stages, no? So there were uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, TV appearances of people being taken to quarantine uh, and uh, how people were reacting and that, I mean, itself would have brought so much of stress to the minds of the others that who were diagnosed to have the illness. So uh, what was, uh, I mean, were there, I mean, have you had any encounters of reactions of that type of, uh, I mean, in, um, say unethical behavior of health professionals contributing to development of any psychiatric problems? Have you encountered any of uh, that nature? Madam, uh, the direct, uh, uh, the uh, the direct encounters, for example, now uh, the reactions of uh, taking them to quarantine, that sort of reactions we did not see. But I can remember one patient, uh, what happened was uh, her relative, uh, the neighbor was taken to quarantine. Then after he came back home, uh, this patient, he started feeling that they are, they are trying to uh, spread Owe it to themselves, that sort of a paranoia, but uh, it was not directly related to the ethics or the media behavior. But that may be partly contributing because that, uh, this uh, concept of COVID was totally new to her, and she thought that the neighbor might, because they were diagnosed as having COVID a few weeks ago, and she thought that the neighbor might contribute to spread COVID to their house because they were not in good terms. So rather than that, I did not uh, encounter any direct uh, ethic-related uh, issues, madam. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, anybody else in the audience? Feeling with regard to uh, particular community, uh, how they have reacted uh, with regard to the final rights of the, um, I mean, the death and things like that? I think, madam, uh, since I am from uh, working in Chilau here, we did not, uh, that mainly the community is uh, somewhat different from the other areas of the country. We basically see uh, the fishing community with a uh, different set of uh, religious beliefs. So, uh, well, this uh, burial rice and that sort of uh, issues we were not, uh, I did not encounter them here. Possibly in that specific areas where people have that sort of beliefs, I think possibly the psychiatrist might have patients of uh, that type of distress. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. I will hand over to our next presenter. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to introduce our next presenter, uh, Dr. Rasmi Sekhar. 
consultant EMD surgeon from DGHLO. He has his education at Health Chandra College, Nigambo, and graduated from University of Sri Jayawatanapra. He completed his foreign training from Princess Royal Hospital, Jennifer, and specialized in head and neck surgeries from Sare and Sussex NHS Trust. Uh, he holds MBBS, MD, MRCS. He has a member of British Endocrine Thyroid Surgeon, so, surgeon uh, member of Head and Neck Ongo Surgeon UK. There are a number of academic research papers uh, to his name, and he had performed transoral and endoscopic thyroid surgery and transoral ultrasonic throat surgery in Sri Lanka for the first time. Uh, he has a prestige having received the Vityanandi President Award. Without further, I invite Dr. Sakaf to deliver his lecture, how to approach change in voice. Yes. I can say good morning, still another one minute more there. Good morning audience and good morning everybody who is listening to me. Uh, but I thought to talk about this, uh, the voice change, which is you know one of these important area related to in ENT because if we don't have the voice, that's it. That means we can't communicate. We know how people are struggling. Uh, if they can't communicate through their voice with the other colleagues or like even, you know, every, everywhere. So this voice is very important, even though we don't much put, you know, we don't put much care on all that. In single, what they say, Yamak Nativunata Pasetama Abidegi Vatnakamate. And now this, uh, the lecture or like, you know, the presentation is not going to be a typical medical school lecture because I'm not going to talk about, you know, or what do you call uh, the causes of the voice change, the history taking, examination, uh, investigation, management, those things. Slightly deviated from that, where we can put much concentrate as the medical colleagues, or like we can identify if there's something is going wrong and we can put them into the direct track. Now, if I start with this, the normal voice, so there are some prerequisites. You know, to have this normal voice, we should have a very good vocal fold or the vocal cords, which has a very good mo for the mobility, and it should be an equal mobility. And there is a mucosa which covers the vocal cord that has all sort of, even though we don't think that has all sort of significant mobility, it's a wave pattern. I will show you some of the video in a couple of uh, slides later. And uh, there should be a optimal coaptation of the vocal cord edges. If they are not coming together, there's going to be another problem. There is to be an issue with the voice there. And there should be optimal motor force and the glottic closure. That means when the vocal cords are closing together, there should be a good pressure for that. And if they are sluggish, again, the voice is going to be affected. Uh, now, our voice is produced when the air is going through the vocal folds, especially in the expiratory phase. So there should be optimal pulmonary support. And there should be optimal timing of the glottic movement or the glottic closure in relation to the onset of the pulmonary expiration. Because suppose that if you are having a good pulmonary expiration and if the vocal cords are not coordinating with that, again, the voice is not coming. And optimal tuning, you know, it's like a guitar. If the guitar is not tuned properly, you can't get the proper the noise or the sounds. So now this, what you call the phonatory expiration. This is, we take the air into the lungs and we pass through the airs in between the vocal cords, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, this happens when we try to speak uh, in the normal conversation or whatever, even the singing also. Vocal cord for vocal folds on the both sides approximate along together their an entire anterior to posterior border. And this should be symmetrical. This should be par with each other. And uh, there are some other things which I just mentioned, I think just go through that, but uh, as I think I need some more time, I'll go to the next slide. Now, uh, the voice change, if we consider the type of voice change, that means the easy fatigability, the, pay, uh, the person might say like 
කතා කරගෙන යනවා ටික වෙලා ආච්චද වයිස් එකේ නැති වෙනවා so that is they are fatigue very quickly they are vocal cords they are not physically but the vocal cords are like that sometimes they talk they can't talk like the voice is not coming it's not audible sometimes the voice is not stable sometimes voice is not compatible with the age and the sex there's another couple of videos there in the latter part of my presentation i will say that i will show you that and uh, when their age was not compatible with their voice and uh, discomfort on pain and phonation and those things also like you know are the reason for the voice change a couple of definition for this voice change because this voice change is a it's a broad category or a, like broad spectrum so dysphonia means there is they, the voice is not coming the voice impairment is there there are difficulty in speaking dysarthria means there is a the difficulty in articulation they want to say something but it's not articulated properly dysarthrophonia means dysphonia mean dysphonia plus dysarthria probably the central nervous system causes or like motor neuron disorders sorry dysphasia impairment of the comprehension of the the spoken or the written language the harshness of voice means the hoarseness now there are a couple of diagnostic problems because it's even the patient comes to us with a hoarse voice it might not be a sort of a straightforward one there can be a multifactorial etiology there and not only that they don't immediately come to us as a you know as a patient we they don't come to us or they don't present they try various methods and uh, to compensate that one so the uh, the patients develop compensatory mechanisms in order to communicate effectively one part is the sign language or they try to talk with from their false vocal cords patients may have more than one condition contributing to the voice disorders this one it's a medical teaching medical school teaching the voice change causes inflammatory structural which i'm not going to talk about that one it's what i thought it's uh, not might be not useful at this moment one of these important instruments or the uh, what you call the uh, the machine is the stroboscopy it's not available everywhere uh, there are some hospitals which are having this luxury this is a bit of a camera like thing which can we from where we can visualize the vocal cords we put a uh, camera through the mouth it's not through the nose it's not the uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy this is a different one so we put the camera through the mouth and we can visualize the vocal cords on the screen but this is uh, different from the foil as i said is an optical illusion caused by the fusion of various phases of glottic cycle because it has a sort of a uh, glistening or like glittering light uh, source there which uh, always almost always compatible or par with the vocal cord movement or like a uh, vocal fold mucosal changes or the mucosal wave the frequency of flashing light as i said should be equal to that of vocal cord vibration side vibratory cycle uh, i got a video for you all this is the video actually i got it from the youtube uh, you can see you can see before starting the video i was still just closely examining the vocal cord movement and the mucosal changes and how it is sort of a vibrating and the how mucosal wave patterns are occurring with this here is a look at some normal young female vocal cords during a stroboscopic exam i'm sorry for that it's not playing i don't know why anyway like uh, it's really nicely moving if you go through the youtube video it's there and mucosal wave we you know as i said in this stroboscopic examination we can see the amplitude of vibration mucosal wave symmetry and the periodicity glottic closure patterns because that is also very important uh, in producing the voice uh non vibrating portions if the one part of these vocal cords are fixed or like you know 
five blows, then you know that is also can be identified. And uh, above the vocal cord, superior to that, we said that uh, the ventricular area is there. So ventricular vibrations also can be noted from this the stroboscopic examination. Uh, the glottic closure, the vocal cords, as I said earlier, they should come together in a symmetrical way. They should get closed very tightly. The normal vocal cords is complete closure. There's a small triangular posterior chain, uh, especially in the females. That other, than, other than that, it's the anterior and the middle part is almost adhering to each other. Uh, sometimes there can be hover glass foliar gap uh, if there is a vocal cord nodules or like nodules in the vocal cord in one, maybe both or one side, especially the peer teachers or like the people who talk too much, you know, like loudly and they get the vocal nodules. And sometimes there can be a slit shape phonatory gap in hyperfunctional dysphonia. This is hyperfunctional dysphonia because the vocal cord tends too much and they can be, there can be a bit of a slit like uh, space there. Or there can be, if the vocal cords are not functioning properly and there can be overshaped phonatory gap what we call it as hypofunctional dysphonia. Uh, there can be irregular phonatory gap if there's a vocal cord growth, especially the malignancies. So the gap is irregular. Again, that they can have the hoarseness of voice. Sometimes the vocal cords are not getting closer properly because if there is a vocal cord falsy, it may be bilateral or even the unilateral one. There may be a big gap in between the vocal cords. I mentioned the non-vibratory portions. That means there can be a scarring of the larynx or the vocal cords, and there can be a dysplastic patches which restrict the movements or the mucosa is fixed to the surrounding area. That's what you call the mucosal fixing. The importance of this stroboscopy or the users, we can detect these early glottic cancers, which is the most important one if it identify these glottic cancers in the early stages, it's 100% curable, or like stage one, or even the stage two. Uh, in the case of vocal folds, not normally visible to make a diet, because even from the fiber optic laryngoscopy, we can't uh, determine these vocal fold movements, or like especially the mucosal fold movements. So the stroboscopy is really useful in that. It's still really useful in the pre and post treatment comparison. Not only the malignancies, even if there's a laryngopharyngeal reflux or if there is a, a sort of a vocal cord weakness, we can I, I, uh, recognize or we can document the pre and post treatment comparison. The vocal hygiene is very important to maintain our good voice. So smoking, number one, a lot of courses, I don't want to mention it again. Avoidance of dust and fumes. I think these days our mask actually doing that job. Uh, reflux prophylaxis. Actually, we most of us don't think about that. Sometimes you can have the hoarseness of voice if you are having a laryngopharyngeal reflux. So uh, uh, even the avoid eating late night, which is also part of uh, what you call the laryngopharyngeal reflux. These are important for this vocal hygiene. We should not shout too much also, or like we should not strain too much from our vocal cords. These are coming under the vocal hygiene. There are some common uh, voice disorders. Now one, two, three, four, five like that. You know, I don't want to go into that. I just mentioned that it's one of these tension dysphonia, laryngitis, laryngopharyngeal reflux vocal nodules, vocal forces, vocal cord paralysis, and then the arytenoid granuloma, or like granuloma in the arytenoid cartilage. Less frequent are sulci, spasmodic dysphonia, papillomatosis, laryngeal trauma, hyperkeratosis, or the malignancies, endocrine causes, amyloid. Now, I'm not going to discuss about this treatment method or the treatment options uh, for the vocal cord uh, pathologies or the laryngeal pathologies. 
uh, because it's a, it's a big entity. There are a lot of you know conservative treatment methods available, non-conservative or like surg medical and the surgical. So I, I, I might need another one hour time for that one. So just basically, I will just talk about some some current trends in these uh, vocal cord treatments or like pathologies treatment for the pathologies in the vocal cords. Uh, Nowadays, this common one is the laryngeal preserving surgeries. Those days, if the patient have laryngeal carcinoma stage three, invariably we go for the laryngectomies. But nowadays we, we can preserve the larynx. One is what you call the TAUS, transoral ultrasonic surgery, uh, where we can use some ultrasonic techno, uh, ultrasonic techno waves to remove the throat cancers. I don't say that you can remove 100%, but you can remove the maximum extent, and then you can go for the adjuvant radiotherapy or chemotherapy, basically the radiotherapy because it's squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, this is a very good technique, you know, like uh, especially in the European countries and America, they perform this one. I'm happy to say that I'm the one who introduced this technique to Sri Lanka and the patient, I did the first patient still surviving without any issue. And uh, the laser surgery is also, it's a uh, uh, latest technique there they use, but if the tumor is extending into the skin or like, you know, stage four B or something like that, there is no way we have to go for the laryngectomy. And uh, this one, actually, I just want to show you, this is the, uh, This is the machine that we use for this uh, transoral ultrasonic surgery. This one. And this is the instrument that we use to, uh, we, uh, uh, use to uh, resect the tumor inside the throat. And uh, this is another interesting case uh, because I got the permission from the patient uh, to put these videos. Uh, this patient has what you call the condition called the pubophonia. He was, I think he, he, yeah, he was around 32, 34 years. Make a video play. 32, 34 years. And uh, you can listen to his voice. So you can see the difference between the two voices. So I think uh, the time is passing. So I'll go for that one. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, yes, I'm happy to answer according to my capacity. Any question from the audience? How often do you see this type of patients? About how many per year? Uh, Madam, it's like this. You're talking about the, the, the last videos we, which I mentioned. Yeah. I yeah. think, yeah, I hear last year, if I say, it's unfortunately last year we didn't do much surgeries because a couple of months only. During that period, I did about, I think, four or five patients. I don't know, may, may, may not be uh, representing the, this thing because sometimes patients come to know and they are coming to me for the voice uh, surgeries. And uh, recently I did another uh, surgery for the patient with uh, transgender patients who was a male and converted to female. I did the ch voice change. And at the moment, the patient is on a speech therapy. That is also first time in Sri Lanka. Only thing, uh, they come to, I, I don't think it's rep uh, just representation of the chilo because patients, they come and I do last year, within maybe around four or five patients within the time period which I did the surgery because we had stopped a lot of surgeries during that period last year. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Rishni, for a, a very good presentation on uh, the voice change. Uh, and uh, we are slightly ahead of time. Thank you for that, Rishni. Uh, and uh, now we have uh, Dr. Khadir Gamatambi Vigneshwaran, consultant urologist. Uh, <coughs> he had his education from Methodist College, Batik Law, and he's a graduate from University of Jaffna. He completed his foreign training at King's College Hospital, London. His academic, uh, academic qualifications are MBBS, MD, and MRCS. He has a number of research papers to his uh, name with local and international publications. And now he's going to talk about uh, Dr. Deas' blood in my urine. Over to you, Vikneshwaran. Thank you, Madam. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. First, I would like to thank to uh, uh, all the organizers for this lecture series. Uh, um, I'm Dr. Vigneshwaran, consultant urological surgeon. So I would like to talk a few words about uh, uh, a topic which I'm going to talk is, doctor, there is a blood in my urine. So, yeah. So the first, uh, now we have seen problems here. So the people are now, they have moved slowly to what they do. They um, really trust on investigations. When we see clocking in the OPDs, like all the wards, they like the few one or two words, and then they quickly move to investigation, x-rays, scans, CTs, and things. There's no forms are not really having all the information. So there is a bit, little bit of discussion with the radiologists. Always they're complaining. Nothing is written. They just order CT scans. So then this is a good topic to discuss so what they wanted to learn. So what they have learned all during these undergraduates and they just completely, they do a different practice when they like working as a house officers. So this is for a basic about the hematuria. So when you see a blood in the urine, is it normal? This is not really normal. So we have to go and we have to think about what we are going to do. So the first things now, when you see blood, we have to think whether the bleeding is coming from maybe from kidney or ureter or a bladder, or in especially a male, we can have a prostate, it's another culprit and the urethra, or there's sometimes the testes and like say they come with um, prostatitis, they can give a blood. And sometimes the also sometimes they give a little bit of blood, right? And uh, so these are the origins of uh, blood or maybe the, the vessels may be around, they can cause a little bit of blood in the urine. Right, so there are a few terminology we should remember. We should know that, that we have already learned during our undergraduate studies. What is this? Hematuria. So what is hematuria? Blood in the urine. So simply say blood in the urine. Then there is a two classifications called visible hematuria. Other one is called non-visible. So the earlier, the term called gross hematuria or a macroscopic hematuria, we have a different picture, macroscopic means the gross amount, the large amount of, so the simply now they have divided a visible hematuria. That means uh, is a sufficient amount of blood just to make the urine to different color, change the color. So that is a cross hematuria, that's called visible hematuria. The other one is a non-visible hematuria where there is, you can't see anything on your, on your normal vision. Then if you put on a microscope, they will say there is a blood in your urine. And then there's a two other category inside, like say they can call symptomatic, the asymptomatic non-visible hematuria or a microscopic hematuria. If it is more than three reds on high power field with asymptomatic, no symptoms, then we'll consider asymptomatic microscopic hematuria. So that's uh, the terminology is a little bit now, time to time they are changing. So if you see blood, urine, urine color is changed, it will be a light red or red or a pink or fully red, this is all called gross hematuria or a visible hematuria, we can see. And microscope is uh, non-visible, right. And uh, there's some basic science behind. People normally, they like, uh, we don't know, the normally people, they excrete red cells in urine. We don't know the, exactly where the blood is coming from. It can be from any area that can come. About, say, about less than five red cells, they can pass, but it's not continuously. Some people, they may pass red cells in the urine, right. And it's uh, very difficult to localize by clinical examination. So that's why we have to do history, all these things. In addition, we have to go for investigations. And uh, I think, however, the certain findings on this urine analysis also will give you a small clue. We'll discuss later. And the microscopy also giving some small clue, like say the red cells are, you see, a normally very smooth, uniform cell cell. It's used to come a little bit lower part of the urinary tract. If it is abnormal, then it's like a change in shapes that's probably coming from the upper part of the urinary system, right? And uh, before you handle the problem, you would have a common, you should at least have some idea of common conditions. That if you have a blood in the urine, maybe you, the common problems are infections, urinary tract infections, any stones from kidney or ureter or bladder anywhere, any trauma history or cancers or bladder or prostate or any areas, any kidney tumors and then diseases, blood disorders or any nephrological causes, right. Then how we are going to approach, it's like simple, again, history, history, history first, and then the physical examination and the diagnosis. 
and then you go for a investigation and the management plan. So I'm going to touch on, I'm not going to touch because it's a common topic for everybody, common people, we'll, we'll move on to the history part. The history part, the, when you see patients, now some house officer sometimes presents no age, no so gender. They just straight away say, the people, there's a patient with the uh, X-ray showing some features of stones and things. So there's no gender, there's no age. So clearly, the gender is very important. Gender is very important, whether it's a female or male. Some problems are very like the same. Some, some problems are very common with males and gender variations. And also age is very important. So like say, a young patient coming with hematuria, we have to think about the gynecology. It's like glomerular causes. There's an elderly man or elderly female coming with hematuria. You have to think about the cancers first, then the stones and stuff. Middle-aged people coming with the hematuria, the stones are the commonest, commonest problem. So the age is again is very considerably important on the history. And chief complaint, if it is a blood in the urine, then there is always there are associated symptoms. We have to handle it. We have to ask from that. We'll go, we'll see later. Then the duration, whether it's an acute problem or a chronic problem. Acute problem, you have to handle, we have to investigate everything immediately. But if it is a chronic, the patient is passing blood in the urine for about six years, it's not an acute problem. You don't need to rush for the CT scan, we we'll rush for the scan immediately. Right. And then the, the presenting symptoms of onset and things are important, whether there is an onset, progressions, and also whether there's a painful or a painless, whole grossuria, what about the streams and all, we have to ask from the patient. Right. And a uh, little bit detail on the associated symptoms. Um, say, so patient with, uh, it's all the basic presentations. So the, when you have a fever, patient hematuria with fever, back pain, dysuria, urgency, frequency, nocturia, think about the UTI. So the UTI, then you have to do something for the UTI. And they say there are patient with stone disease, previous stone disease, loin to groin pain. The first thing is about renal disease. So you can clinically, we can diagnose most of the condition. Why it is very important. It is a good area where Chilau, we have very limited scan, limited facilities. See this can also, we won't be able to do it then and there. We can't do a ultrasound scan then and there. With the basic investigation take us time. So clinical practice, we have to come back to the basic clinical again. Uh, then the patient with the weight loss and there's abdominal pain. Then there's a probably, there is a cause of uh, renal cell cancer also present like abdominal pain and the weight loss. And uh, any history of smoking, weight loss, and the interstitial worker, then there's a possibility of getting a bladder cancer, right? And symptom of uh, prostatic obstruction, significant poor flow, intermittency, and um, there's a, um, a straining and all, then you have to see it could be a prostatic origin maybe a cancer or benign. And uh, recent sore throat, uh, or like say patient is fluid bloated and edema, hypertensive patient, which is a nephrology, nephritis causes, right? And uh, there is something, other thing you have to ask from whether there is any history of fall, right? Abdominal pain, any urethral injuries, are, they can present with hematuria, blood in the stream, within about 30 seconds, they come with blood in the stream after the fall, right? So, and uh, history of any heart murmurs in examination, that then you have to think about the endocarditis. And the uh, bleeding disorders, like they may have on any anticoagulation systems and all. And uh, cyclical hematuria, you have to worry about whether there is any, you the gynecologists can uh, think about a gynecological problem. They always have some kind of uh, um, cyclical uh, um, hematuria, right? And uh, the pattern of hematuria is another important thing and the color of the urine you have to observe. Color of the urine, there are certain other substance also can go, that is called pseudohematuria. The pseudo, so that's like a rifampicin, beetroot can change the color. So you have to see, this is a rifampicin can cause uh, hematuria. This is a beetroot can cause hematuria. So we had to ask from the history. Otherwise, unnecessarily we have to go for an unnecessary investigation and whether the patient is passing clots. So if there's a clots, in addition, we indirectly what they're saying, the bleeding a little bit more or massive. So there is enough time to form a clot inside the bladder. So those are a little bit of urgent problems. Right. And uh, family history is another influence, like say, 
other policies they give the disease patients, like we have a family history of other policies they give the, we have to investigate the whole family, not the one, the main person, right? And uh, some sickle cell disease patient can come with hematuria, which can cause papillary necrosis. And uh, the travel histories we have to worry about, so cystosomiasis is common. Like now we have seen so many patients here also. Now, uh, uh, before the COVID, people are moving all over the places. They are bringing all these, even cystosomiasis. We have diagnosed so many patients here. Right. And then this is drug, drug history anyway. It's another important, let's say, rifampicin. Some, they can go cyclophosphamide. Oncologists, they give various tablets which has got cystitis. The commonest one is cyclophosphamide. So the drug history is again important. These are a list of drugs we have written here. These all can cause immaterial. Right. And uh, now, there's a history we just broadly discussed. And when you go to the physical examination, uh, the material with hypertension, anything, we have to think about the renal cell cancers. And uh, there may be adult polycystic kidney also present with uh, a little bit of high blood pressure. And uh, they have a fever, hematuria, loin pain, chills and rigors. Uh, yeah, we have to think about pyelonephritis, right? And uh, now people are not really examining here. So when you examine, you will get most of the things. Like they may have a urethral trauma. The people usually, they remove the catheters in accident service. And then patient admitting with uh, hematuria, they all investigate again with ultrasound scan, CT scan, all sort of things. But when you go and see the meatus, we will see the meatus is um, um, traumatized. This happened last week. One of the patients has gone to accident service. They pull out the catheter. The minor staff, they pull out the catheter without deflating the balloon. They're coming with massive bleeding. They have gone to all the investigation again. And then, uh, then only then after, like after about two days, they are diagnosed. Now, what the problem is, this is removed by um, uh, the traumatic urethral um, injuries. And uh, yeah, and always don't, always do a digital rectal examination, whether you can see it is a cancer prostate or now people are not really doing a digital rectal examination. And then the gynecological problems, they, when you, female coming with hematuria, always see whether there is a, uh, a period. The, there is a no, menstrual bleeding or they can really, they will come and say hematuria, but if you ask, sometimes that is a uh, menstrual bleeding, they can interpret as a hematuria. Right. And, uh, and the inspections, if it is a vasculitis or any other cause of hematological bleeding, you can see other areas of the multiple area bleeding from all over the places. So that we have to see. And also there's a rashes over the body that will give you a small clue. This is not a urological problem. This is a generalized problem, not a local problem. And uh, always examine and see the palpation and see your abdomen. There is any masses you can see. Any tenderness, if there's a tenderness, something is abnormal, whether it's with hydronephrotic kidneys or there may be a renal cell cancer. So you have to see, examine the abdomen. And uh, um, auscultations for it's like, say, sometimes you can see murmurs also can come. Uh, right. And uh, this is another issue. Uh, pediatric people, they may see deafness and there's a visual problems and they can come with uh, hematuria with the renal failure. Right. Now, after the history and examination, now we have a differential diagnosis. It could be a trauma, it could be a calculate, it could be a neoplasm with a primary or whatever, the metastasis, whatever, the neoplasm with the cancer, or there may be a coagulation problem. Some other differential also, whether we have there's a renal causes or any familial diseases, it could be infections, so something we put a differential diagnosis. And then they had to go for investigations. Very simple investigation and basic investigation of this called do a urine analysis and the urine culture. That will give you an idea whether the patient is having a UTI or whether there's a stone. If you do a UFR that's showing during the pain, patient coming with blood in the urine and then the other side is having a pain, loin pain, do a UFR. If a UFR is positive, that is fairly about 90% sensitive of stone disease, right? In a patient about young, about 30, 35 year old man with the history of UFR is almost his diagnostic. And the uh, urine culture will tell you that before you start, anybody coming with, this is another problem. Anybody coming with blood in the urine, they send UFR. UFR shows some red cells and pus cells. They give antibiotic, they send them home. Patient won't come back. 
they will come back after six months with the full blown cancer with the, you can't do anything on that stage. The better way, if you do a, when you come to UFR, send the urine culture, possible you do the, all the investigation or you just direct to somebody. Uh, it's not uh, like Western countries, they have, a, they have a way of tracing the people. They know how to catch the people. They always in some clinics, they are in a certain follow-up plans. We have no follow-up plan. They come only in that time to the accident service. And uh, when you do medicine, they will go back and they will come maybe in about six months or one month, one year. So there's no way to trace those people. So as much you can, you think about the patient, whether it, what type of problem they may have and try to do things on the same time. Right? Don't think the patient will come back again. Never come back most of the time. Right. So we have to do basically UFR. When you see a patient with uh, you, um, blood in the urine, you send a urine analysis, send a urine culture. And if possible, you do the basic full blood count, the renal profile, where you can see maybe a CKD patient. Here we see a huge number of CKD patients, and you may see HP, maybe a little bit low. It may be a bleeding chronically. So with HP, you can get idea of hemoglobin. And also whether it's an infection or whatever you can see on these two basic investigations. And then you, if you think it's the prostate can, you can do PSA and bleeding tendency and all these little bit specific tests. Uh, this is sometimes now people are not really doing. This is a little bit interesting. They ask in the exams, three glass tests. I don't know whether people have idea about this, three glass tests. This is a common test they're asking to have an undergraduate exams. So they will give you three glasses. You have to pass urine in your first first part on your one bottle, one glass, and then the middle mid part of the stream in another another uh, glass, and then you are end of the urine with another. So then you can compare the color of the urine, whether it's a, a blood like a hematuria on the initial part, it's probably a urethral sources coming from the initial part. If it is the, the mid part, think about bladder or the renal, it's coming from the upper tracts. And this is the end of the urine coming from the prostate, usually a blood and neck issues. So this may ask in the exams, maybe asking the postgraduate also, right? And then uh, now, then now we have to go for the imaging and imaging. Imaging, uh, uh, now what we do is ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan is a very important investigation. If a patient like, I mean, with the one problem and patient is admitted to hospital, as try your best to do ultrasound scan during that admission, not to discharge and not to send, uh, not to give a date for comfort for the clinic to do ultrasound scan. You may miss so many problems, right? Even can urethral colic or the renal cell cancer, most of the renal cell cancers are incidental. So, so what we have to try your best, the patient is admitted, you do ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan will tell you the very good information about the kidneys and the ureter, and also other pathology of ovaries and livers and all other things. And uh, this is a very good information about the bladder and the prosthetic issues. But ultrasound scan is not the investigations to see a problem in the bladder, right? Bladder like a large lesions, the like ultrasound scan they can say, but it is uh, not the good investigation to see the bladder problems. So. But the kidneys and the ureta, this is a um, ideal investigation. Now they can give you more information about the kidneys and ureta. And then we have to do a CT scan. That's again, right. Now, if it is a mic anybody with microscopic hematuria, that's called non-visible hematuria. We have to do the basic UFR. We have to do the normal blood and all the investigation. Take an X-ray also, extra k UV. And also we have to do the ultrasound scan. If everything is normal, then we have to think what to do next. But if it is a visible hematuria, ultrasound scan, and then if it is nothing on the ultrasound scan, we have to do a CT scan. CT scan is always, we do a CT uh, urogram, where there's a urographic phase also, we have to see anything in the ureters. Um, usually you won't be able to see on the normal CTs. So you have to do a CT, Euro, CT urogram is also must. And uh, then the if it is all we talk about all these things in microscopic material now the investigation we have to do a flexible cystoscopy everybody any patient whether it's a microscopic or a macroscopic 
whether you're young or old, you have to do a flexible cystoscopy to exclude any problem from the bladder. The bladder's lesion, especially a small lesion, we may miss. So the only investigation is called flexible cystoscopy that will tell you, is there any problem in the bladder? Right. So, but if ultrasound shows some abnormal things in your bladder, then to avoid to more for the flexibility, just go for a rigid cystoscopy and then we remove, uh, go for the according to the cystoscopy finding, we'll go for that. And uh, when you do a flexi, you can see this is a lesion. This is a large number of, uh, it's a very huge bladder lesion. This you may miss on the ultrasound scan, but you can see on a flexible cystoscopy. Flexible cystoscopy is must. So with any, anybody coming with uh, visible or non-visible prematuria. Right. And depending on the rest of the problem, we will move, right? If you see a bladder tumor, we'll put a camera and then we will do a, G, a rigid cystoscopy. And then this is under spinal or a G, a G, GS, uh, general anesthesia, we'll go and do, this is a, a prostate. So we handle on the prostate. Same thing, this is called TURP, is called prostate. Same thing we can do a tumor, we can resect by uh, endoscopes, that's called TURBT, right? This is an endoscopic view, we remove the prostate. At the same time, the same um, type of surgery, we remove uh, bladder tumor in the bladder. Right. Uh, right. Another issue that we have to see, the patient is coming with massive bleeding and they bleeding inside the bladder and that form a clot and they come with the clot retention. So now this is another emergency that is going to the hematuria. They may come with a little bit of blood, but when you do a scan and when you examine, you may see a large bladder, palpable bladder. Ultrasound, they may see a huge amount of clot inside the bladder. What are we going to do? Now we have to put a three-way catheter and you just do a little bit of bladder washout. So sometimes this little bit of bladder washout, they remove the initial clot and they all will drain the urine and the blood, all they can drain. So then you can do a little bit of irrigation to stop all these things. But in the large amount of clot, organized clot, then this patient has to go for general anesthesia to remove all the clots. And then, then depending on the problem, we have to do whether the TURBT or diatomy or whatever for the problems. Right. And uh, sometimes stone disease can cause hematuria. So the stone size and size and the place, there are different modalities available. So if it is a stones uh, in the kidney, we can do extracorporeal shock lithotripsy for ESWL that to fragment the stone that will pass. This is non-invasive, but the efficiency is a little bit varies about 40 to 50%. Now they have a new, new technologies coming up. So uh, ESW is slowly going away from our urological field, but this is a stone causing hematuria. We have to do uh, the proper treatment for stones. Right. And, um, and uh, this is uh, like a ESWL machines and stuff. And uh, if it is stone in the ureter or a bladder, you, this is called UR, ureteroscopy, and we can uh, laser the stone and remove the problem. Now, this is the stones inside the ureter. We just do the lasering. Uh, then there is the stone blocking somewhere, then we can remove by endoscopically. And there are other topics called PCNL. They can remove the stones by uh, fragmenting by laser and other uh, different uh, energy sources or you can go for open surgical procedures to remove the stones, right? And if it is a cancer, this is a, a resected specimen of kidney cancer. So this is also another thing we have to think about it. It is a, a common presentation, about 80 to 90 percent are incidental findings. So you want, the patients are coming for some of the problems. They come for a hematuria, it's a good thing. So they come, so you will do ultrasound scan, you may see a cancer. They come for some other abdominal pain, gastritis, usually they have gastritis, some other reason, they do a scan, they, they will identify the renal cell cancer. This is a, one of the good type of cancer, if you like people prefer, this is a good type of cancer. If you diagnose early and the prognosis is very good. If you diagnose late and prognosis is very miserable. So now we have a, the problem is everywhere even all the small channeling on all the places they have ultrasound scan they can do scans the people are usually prefer to go for ultrasound scan so anyone coming with blood in the urine better you can advise them go and have ultrasound scan as a basic investigation 
the cheap and it is not very expensive about 2000 or something it is worth for the patient's life so there's no harm they are normally you don't need to force they can advise them to go and have an ultrasound scan that will give you a try to get a good quality ultrasound scan think about who is going to do also so refer to a good radiologist if you see getting a scan by radiologist you may think about them and you send to the good radiologist to do a, a good quality ultrasound scan we have to think about the money of the patients also. So we'll send to a good radiologist to do a good quality ultrasound scan. That is really enough for about for another two or three years. And uh, so, and before that, what I'm, the summary what I'm going to give you at the take home message, anyone coming with blood in the urine, right? Anyone coming with blood in the urine, whether it's, so we have to do the basic investigations, UFR, renal function, full blood count, and also X-ray KUB and the ultrasound scan. There's no alternative for that. And then, and depending on the findings, we have to decide whether we want to go for a CT scan or not. But anybody more than 40 years, all these things are normal. You have to go for a CT scan to exclude any upper tract problems. And all patients, we, we have to do a ultrasound a flexible cystoscopy to exclude any problem from the bladder. Right. And uh, that's all about this hematuria. Uh, any, any issues you would like to ask me? Thank you, very Thank you uh, Dr. Vikneshwaran, uh, for a uh, very informative and interesting uh, lecture on hematuria. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite. Uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, all our speakers uh, for the session. Yeah, David, yeah, you can do uh, a CT scan. Yeah. The, no, you said that ultrasound and then to go for the practices C, to write CTKUB, isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, now, when we do CTKUB, now generally we do a uh, CT is very sensitive in picking up stones, isn't it? That is a bell. If you are thinking about the renal uh, stones in the renal system, the non contrast CT scan is the ideal. What they do in the West, uh, straight away, then A and E, ED, they straight away they do a non contrast CT scan. They, 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 like before they, they are not doing ultrasound scan, the on, on admission, they do a CT scan. With the CT scan, they refer, refer to urology. The problem here, the practically we won't be able to do a CT scan, even admitted patients, it's take about one week or some time to get a CT scan day. So then we are now we are going back to the normal, the basic stuff about five years back or even 10 years back. We do again UFR, XTK, UB, ultrasound scan. Then we think about the CT scan. Uh, now for CT stuff, um, what I'm familiar is with the CT of the brain. Now we do 10 millimeter cuts, 5 millimeter cuts, 2 millimeter cuts. Uh, say if it's pituitary, we might do 2 millimeter cuts. Uh, whereas if it's the cortex, that we might do 10 millimeter cuts. So likewise, now if you go from uh, kidney to the bladder, uh, what is the range of cuts that you do? Um, uh, won't that miss tumors, uh, not tumors, stones that are small? about this like uh, the millimeter size i think uh, we would like to ask from the radiological team but it's a normally uh, 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 i don't know that probably 0.5 millimeter i think i'm not really sure about the, the size the, the, but this no. is yeah, yeah the now uh, don't they do axial cross-sectional cuts that they do i'm not really sure about this man but you know that it's sensitive it yeah, it is, it is, this is stones is 99 non contrast CT. That is the uh, first line investigation in the West. Still, we do that, that, that <coughs> first line, but we won't be able to do it in here. But in the private sector, there most of the people they do non contrast CT scan. It's a very short time, nothing, it's five minutes job. We do, we know the diagnosis. So, according and to the I cost now. Now the price is also now there. We usually dropped in the private sector. The earlier they twenty five thousand, now it dropped to thirteen thousand, twelve thousand. So it is available for everywhere. So it is simply the one investigation solves most of the problems. And uh, do we do IVUs nowadays? 
not peer review. We do CTI reviews. Sorry, CTI reviews. CTI reviews, yes. That is more informative than the IVs. IVs, no? Yeah. Right, right. No, the CTs, of course, I think anyone could do, but then because that IVU is involved with contrast, then one has to sort of think twice that, and I think it's the correct person that who should order it, isn't it? Yes, yes. Now, the, the, that's also now, uh, say, we don't need to do a CT IVU for everybody. Like, so significantly, there's a risk factors and the gross hematuria, elderly people, then uh, we have to go for a CT IVU. Otherwise, like um, if we have good quality ultrasounds, that's telling there's nothing in the uh, upper tracts and the bladder, and we can do a flexible cystoscopy. And uh, if your creatinine is very high, and then we don't need to put the patient on that, we can do a follow-up ultrasound scan. Okay. So, so depending on that, we can't make a proper guidelines for our population, a little bit modified according to what the facilities we have. Sometimes we also be used to that creatinine is about five, six, and with a good ultrasound scan showing nothing in the kidneys, and we did a flexi that is also normal. So almost we have excluded, but it's not really sure. Still, we are not doing a CT. We do a non-contrast CT to exclude any stone disease. So that's yeah. not going to affect the kidneys. And then we will do another follow-up ultrasound scan in three months' time. It's also normal. We just keep on our follow-up. Just right. to, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, from the audience, like there's no more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the absence of uh, any question, any more questions, I'd like to uh, wind up the second session uh, of uh, the joint clinical meeting between the SLMA and uh, uh, Chilla Clinical Society. And uh, with that, uh, we would wind up our uh, uh, whole uh, the regional clinical meeting. So uh, we have come to the end of a successful uh, regional clinical meeting organized by SLMA in collaboration with the Chile Clinical Society. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me uh, to have uh, part, uh, supported in organizing this event uh, during this uh, challenging time. Uh, on behalf of uh, Chile Clinical Society, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to SLMA uh, for facilitating this forum in order yeah, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, uh, where academic sessions are very rare. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, CCP president, uh, Dr. Fatma Gunaratna, and uh, uh, Dr. Sarat Gamedi Silva and the other council members uh, for giving us this opportunity. And uh, also uh, the speakers, uh, Dr. Kesara Ratna Tunga, uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, and Dr. Shehan Silva, uh, uh, who gave us support uh, in uh, presenting uh, from the SLMA side. And uh, uh, this uh, clinical meeting wouldn't have been a success uh, without uh, the support uh, given to me uh, by our council members. Uh, namely Dr. Malinti Adhikarama, our secretary, and uh, Dr. Sarat Gamagi and Dr. Namal Fernando, and uh, also uh, Dr. Osandar uh, Bevasurendra from the quality management unit uh, who gave us uh, technical support with regard to this. And I'd like to really thank all the doctors uh, from uh, who participated uh, for this meeting. Uh, in spite of uh, running uh, the Bingiria Corona Treatment Center, as well as uh, Iranavila uh, Treatment Center, which are under our hospital, as well as uh, another Corona Diagnostic Unit, uh, our doctors have participated uh, in this meeting. Uh, I really welcome, uh, like to appreciate their participation. Uh, and I hope uh, you will appreciate the academic activities uh, which, which are organized and uh, uh, the knowledge we gather today will shed light to our clinical practice tomorrow and uh, it will benefit the patients in the future. And uh, I would like to uh, give a special thank to uh, Dr. Shehan Silva who has been uh, very much active 
uh, in organizing this event uh, from the time he proposed he was uh, giving calls to us and uh, trying to uh, organize this uh, until the last moment uh, he was really involved in this thank you shahan back again for all the support given and uh, last but not least i'd like to thank our sponsors uh, george stewards uh, uh, for their generous contribution without uh, whom this event wouldn't have been a success with that uh, let me yeah. also thank, thank you uh, let me also communicate on behalf of the council of the sri lanka medical association let me communicate my sincere gratitude to the uh, Chilau Clinical Society, particularly to Dr. Sanat Fernando, and also to the director, Dr. Kapila Malavarachi, and particularly to Dr. Anushika, uh, who has been a sort of active member with us uh, in the Sri Lankan Association of Geriatric Medicine for the uh, coordinating uh, this uh, activity uh, for the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the commitment of uh, all the members and the uh, council of the Chilau Clinical Society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.